Good evening, counselors. Good evening. Good evening, members of the public who are watching on Zoom. My name is Val Gilman. I'm a Ward 4 City Councilor, and I'm also the Council President. I'd like to welcome you all to our May 24th, 2022 City Council meeting. Before we um, introduce each other to the members of the public and to each other, because we're here in person finally after a long wait, I'd like to ask that we stand and salute to the flag and um, Councilor Machota will lead the flag salute in a brief moment of silence. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now a moment of silence for the 14 students and the one teacher who got killed in the elementary school in Texas today. Thank you, Councilor. Please be seated. So I'd like to introduce the members of the Council that are here tonight. Um, first of all, we have Frank Majota, who is our Ward 3 City Councilor. Hello. Councilor Jamie O'Hara, who is an at-large City Councilor. Councilor Sean Nolan, who is the Vice President of our City Council and is also the Ward 5 City Councilor. Tracy O'Neill, who is our Ward 2 City Councilor. Councilor Jeff Wordley, who is at large. And Scott Memard, who is our Ward 1 City Councilor. Both Councilors Bro and Gross are not here tonight. We also, on city staff, we have Max Shank, who is our Director of Public Health, and Jill Cahill, who is our CAO. And in looking up at the attendees, I believe that that is it. And of course, we have Joanne Sinos, who is our City Clerk. Grace Poirier, who is our Assistant City Clerk, is in the audience here. And Ryan Knowles, who is our IT Director, is here as well. Also, Pam Toby on behalf of Mayor's oh, great. Office. Thank you, Councilor. So Pam Toby is here as Director of Communications and Constituent Services for the city. And Kenny Coster is on as oh, an great. attendee. Kenny Coster is here as well as an attendee. So he is our auditor. So first order of business is the legal language. So I will begin with that. And then I'll ask Madam Clerk to call the first order. So in the interest of government transparency with regards to deliberations and decisions made by the city council and according to open meeting law, since this meeting was posted as a Zoom meeting, this meeting is recorded by video and audio and will be conducted by remote participation. Additionally, all votes taken by the city council during this and future remote meetings will be by roll call vote. If you're calling in on a phone, you can press star nine to request to speak if you're watching. On a computer or device, there is a raised hand button that you can tap or press to request to speak. Please use either of these options during oral, oral communications to be recognized to speak. First order of business, Madam Clerk. First order of business is oral communications. Oral communications. The public shall have the opportunity at every regularly scheduled meeting to be heard under oral communications on matters not appearing on the agenda. Oral communications shall allow any resident who has a request or complaint of any nature relative to city business to appear before the city, before the council, excuse me, state their problem without debate, and the matter shall be referred to the proper agency through the office of the mayor. The resident will be notified within a two-week period relative to the disposition of same, and a copy shall be forwarded to the city council. Persons speaking under oral communications shall be limited to three minutes each. The council president shall not allow complaints as to individual performance. Is there anyone here that would like to speak to the council in oral communications? So we have Rose and Rose, you have up to three minutes to um, introduce yourself and your address and speak to us in something that is not on the agenda.
And I have to promote it as a panelist. I don't know. Okay. I'll just promote it. Okay, Rosemary, um, we are going to um, introduce you and um, would you um, state your name and address and you have up to three minutes to talk to us. Oh, I did press it, but it's not coming over. So, Rosemary, can you accept our taking you in as a panelist right now? Because I believe you have an older version of Zoom. So the hand raising is not working. Is that correct, Ryan? Put them on. Did and I promoted it as a panelist. Okay, you're here, so we can. Um, can you hear us, Rosemary? Rosemary, can you hear us? It says that she's connecting to her audio. So this says that you are connected to the audio and we're waiting to hear you. This is why we're trying this out for the first time. <laughs> are we good? No, she's still connecting to audio. Trying to call in. Rosemary, could, if we gave you a phone number, could you try to call in on your phone? If you could write this down, it would be great. 1 301 715 8592. And the meeting ID is 820 5438. Two one seven five. If you wouldn't mind, if you can hear us right now and you're able to do that, I'll repeat the meeting ID eight two zero five four three eight two one seven five. So maybe you can try calling in on your cell phone. You can keep trying, and if anyone else would like to speak, would you raise your hand? Okay, Rosemary is on now, and um, can you hear us now, Rosemary? Can you hear us now, Rosemary? Um, Rosemary, this is, you're at the city council meeting and we can see that you are trying to connect to the audio. Um, you had tried to call in and now you are back to being a panelist to the audio. What does she need to punch in on her phone if she's connecting by telephone? She already tried that. So I'll give it, I'll give you the phone number one more time. To join via phone, it's 1-301-715-8592. And then the meeting ID is 820-543-8175. Councilor Nolan? Maybe we should move on to the next term business. Okay, I agree. No other hands raised at this point. Thank you, Councillor. So, um, Rosemary, we will, um, when you come back on, we will move to, um, to bring you in so you can speak in public comments. So please keep trying if you're hearing us. You explained about pressing star nine in order to speak. 
you get that? Oh, right. That was in the intro, but that's a good point, Council Member. Um, when you when you come back on, we'll ask you to hit star nine if you call in on the number that I just gave you. That will allow her to speak. Right. Thank you. Okay, so next order of business, Madam Clark. Next order of business is a presentation from the Director of Public Health, Max Shank. Presentation on policy changes from the State Reclamation and Mosquito Control Board. Great, thank you. Welcome, Max. Um, you're here because of popular demand at our last meeting. We had this on the consent agenda, just as an information only, and our council unanimously decided that we'd love for you to come back and tell us more about um, this opt-out program and similar to what you discussed at the Board of Health meeting. So if, um, if you could do that, that would be terrific. So you've got the floor and we're all watching you on big screen like we're at a drive-in movie, so. I appreciate that. I wanna thank Zoom for giving me a nice tan apparently. So, um, <laughs> And I appreciate this opportunity. It, it is rather a complex and confusing situation that we find ourselves in. So let's do a little bit of history. Uh, Councilors may remember last year when the uh, state, and specifically the State Reclamation and Mosquito Control Board, as well as the State Department of Public Health and Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, all kind of got together and decided that uh, should there be a declared emergency regarding Triple E, and that's Eastern Equine Encephalitis, a uh, rather horrible um, virus that uh, can be incredibly debilitating and deadly, uh, should, and it's also mosquito-borne virus, but should that become an issue and in certain areas that they would perform spraying uh, to help prevent any uh, possible contagion. So. Uh, they did, however, at that time, uh, provide an opportunity for communities to what's been known as opt out. So what does that mean? It means that each community had the, it would present a plan for how they would approach doing um, mosquito control, education and outreach, uh, should there be a concern. So now I wanna emphasize the fact that Gloucester uh, at least in, in at least the 16 years that I've been here, plus, uh, has never had an, a West Nile virus or Eastern equine encephalitis case. So Gloucester was well positioned to put forward an opt-out application as a, um, as a community. So we did that, the Board of Health and the department did that on behalf of the council. The council voted, you know, reviewed and voted on that. We put it forward to the Executive Office of Environmental Affairs and they um, accepted the application. So therefore we are officially opted out at that point. Let's fast forward to now. So they've changed the rules and I wanna take this opportunity to uh, put a shout out to Patty Page uh, and her compadres who you know, kind of helped because you know, as you know, you can't be on top of everything all the time. And they were kind enough to kind of keep an eye on this issue and give us a little bit of a heads up that changes were in the works and so, and yes, they were. So what we found out on April 8th and not even from the Executive Office of Environmental Affairs, it came to us through the Department of Public Health via the <laughs> Executive Office of Environmental Affairs that they had changed the rules. So where before we were considered a low risk community, they put us into a high risk region changing the rules essentially for how we had to respond. And what does that mean to be a high risk region? It means that we ourselves didn't have any cases for Tripoli e or West Nile virus. However, neighboring communities had, and therefore we were immediately grabbed uh, to be a part of that region. As a, for instance, because we didn't have any cases and didn't have a history of any cases, Rockport, which also did not have any cases, and because it's bordered by the ocean on the other side, is considered a low risk community. So Rockport owes us a debt of gratitude for that. Uh, but what does it mean for Gloucester and wanting to do an opt out application this year? What it means is that we would have to be able to provide the same level of uh, response action capability as the state would in that instance. So if you, so as a, for instance, we would have to be able to provide planes for doing 
flyover spraying, we'd have to have the trucks available to uh, you know, provide neighborhood spraying if necessary. We'd have to be able to go out into a field, into the field, into certain areas to be able to do hand spraying if necessary. It was just a capacity that this community could not come forward with. And you know, let's be frank, they essentially shoehorned us into it. Now, having said all of that, um, what does that mean in the end? So we opted out last year and no emergencies were declared. So nothing happened. And we expect, you know, hope or hopeful at least that the same thing is gonna happen this year and that it'll continue to be that way uh, unless there's you know, a declared emergency. But even then, um, you know, there are opportunities for individual property owners, even though the community itself can't opt out individual property owners can opt out. And with a uh, shout out to Councillor Groh, who was nice enough to attend the Board of Health meeting, uh, he followed up with some additional questions that he had and he helped us work through and uh, frequently asked question FAQ that's now on our website. And it helps pe walk people through what's happened, what they can do, how they can uh, apply online to opt out individually uh, where they can get information, how they can be notified if there is spraying going to take place. There's a link to a map that the state will put up to show areas where there may be spraying. So there's a lot of information there and I encourage counselors to go there. If you go onto the health department website, uh, there's a, a um, link there right on the page that says mosquito opt out. So it's pretty easy to see. And uh, so, but, there is a caveat even to that. So if the state does declare uh, an emergency and that usually takes, according to what I've been hearing, it takes about 48 hours for them to be able to respond. Uh, and if there is a declared emergency, they could, if it's a high enough emergency, still spray areas regardless of whether or not uh, individual property owners have opted out. So they need to be aware of that and read a little bit more in detail on the information. Uh, that's the 30,000 foot view of this. So in short, whereas before the health department and the board of health and the council worked together to get the application in on time and get it accepted, there really isn't any point in doing it this time. There, it's not cost effective to, and there's no way we could turn around and you know, respond the way they need us to. So I think probably the best thing for me to do at this point is respond to any questions the council members may have. Great, thank you, Max. Council, <laughs> what questions do you have to Max? Council Worthley. Thank you, thank you, Max, for your presentation. Can you guys hear okay on that end? Okay, so this is alarming and thank you for bringing it to our attention. Um, you said we're, combined into a high risk region. Um, is that region working collaboratively to opt out or do you have connections with your health department colleagues um, in other communities that have communities that are opting out or providing, sorry, the capacity to uh, opt out by having their own ability to do it? So for the fact that we're in a high risk region, um, there's only one other community I can think of uh, let me back it up a little bit, I apologize. So what's being proposed is above and beyond what would be done by uh, for a community that is a uh, partner of, or part of the Mosquito Control District. So uh, the Mosquito Control District is a year round um, opportunity provided at cost obviously uh, to different communities for doing not only mosquito control, but monitoring and uh, sampling and testing. So it's a, it's a broad menu of items that you can pull from. It's the cost of that. And this, the city did look at it several years ago at this point uh, and wondered whether or not it'd be worth going into it. The board recommendation at that time was to you know, participate, but just if we could, take the testing part of it so and sampling parts so that we could focus our attention on certain areas in terms of education and outreach because still the most effective way of protecting yourself against West Nile virus and Triple E is personal protection as far as we're concerned and education and just being aware of 
uh, what you can do to pre help prevent exposure. So, but the cost was a, at that time, at least was over $80,000 a year with a mandated three-year contract. And so that was a pass on that. Uh, the only community to get back to your question, Councilor Worthley, the only other community that I'm aware of in that's part of the um, high risk region is Essex. Uh, Manchester is part of the Mosquito Control District and all the other communities that are uh, in this are also part of the Mosquito Control District. So they have those services anyway and probably would utilize them in, in the uh, case of an emergency. So you said that, the, if I may, oh, okay. sorry. You had said that the state typically responds in 48 hours. Is that the requirement that they're asking communities to be, I think you, you said we can opt out if we have the capacity to do this. Is it a 48 hour response time that we need to be able to demonstrate? No, um, forgive me. So the, in order for the, to opt out as a community, you would have to get that process done by May 27th. So we would literally tonight have to put forward a plan for the council to vote on, which the recommendation obviously of the board was to not do that because it didn't make any sense. However, individual property owners uh, can opt out anytime during the year, but they do need to take into account the fact that it will probably take time for them to review and uh, make sure that those addresses are included on their list of opt out uh, places. So if when you so trying to opt out within that 48 hours likely wouldn't work what i was thinking was if we don't spend the money but encumber the money and pool resources with other communities that are like-minded could we be in a position to say okay we might be ready to respond to obviously we're not going to do the next two days but for next year can we say we don't want to spend the money but we encumber the money and have a, someone on on hold on on call to uh to protect us I think that might be something to consider. You said that you gave us a 30,000 foot view. One concern I have is if a plane is flying and I opt out, which I have opted out, how could they possibly be able to project that the spray that they're spraying is not gonna land on my little poster staff? I think the idea is at least in some of the information that's finally coming forward from uh, the uh, State Reclamation Board, that it's going to be a progressive thing. So much in the way that we planned, I mean, our plan uh, last year was education and outreach, and that's their initial thoughts, is that notify uh, property owners, people in the community of what's going on, and then progress. If the situation is getting worse or seem to be getting worse, then possibly truck spraying. Now, truck spraying um, obviously would be a lot easier for people to be able to opt out uh, the maximum distance I think that the spray can go is probably 300 feet. And, but from what I've read online, uh, people would, are asked that they would put up basically pie tins saying no spray on them at the front of their properties so the trucks would know. Uh, when it comes to aerial spraying, I agree. I'm not quite sure how they would manage that, especially, um, but that's something I would have to look into further. Thank you. Um, let's share the floor and then we'll go back to you. Um, Council Majota. Um, just with the spray, like um, ramification for um, like people who garden or like children or like what, like what kind of spray is it? Like, is it gonna kill my tomato garden or is it gonna, you know, harm my kids? Like what, what is it? No, you know, obviously they, on, on the state's websites, the information that they provide for the types of sprays used and there's more than one they could potentially use um, the one that they're considering, or excuse me, the one they advertise the most is basically uh, derived from geraniums, essentially. So technically um, organic in a certain way, but um, it's, you know, but they do say that if you have standing water outside, if you have, um, like I have at my house, I have fountains, active fountains, if they spray, they you should dump, dump them out, refill them, refresh the water. Um, any vegetables, anything like that, you should wash them before bringing them in like you would anyway. And it should come off pretty easily. Uh, but again, I would refer to, because I can't remember everything all the time, uh, I would refer to the FAQ that we put up on our website 
uh, for questions like that. It's pretty extensive and it guides you towards answers to specific questions about types of spray used, what management you would need to do in your home, but it's not deemed to be harmful, at least to humans. Thank you. And nice tan, by the way. Thank you. I'm, I'm pretty pleased with that. I hope it'll follow with me as I go home. <laughs> Councilor Nola. How you doing tonight, Max? Thank you for being here. Thank um, you, Councilor. Basically, the guidelines that we're, that we're looking at, the guidelines being set by the state, the Board of Health, or the state. Um, the same people looking out for our safety and our concerns with COVID, mask wearing, and other issues that can be airborne or you know, bloodborne. Um, so I, I don't see this as being an issue of being bad. I think that if they deemed it that we can't opt out without penalty, then we are a situation where we may need this. And I think that the, the people that do this for a living are the ones that we really should be talking about and listening to. So thank you. Yep, thank you. I appreciate that, Counselor. Max, I had a couple of questions. Um, one of them is, how severe were the cases of the local folks that contracted AAA? It's an excellent question. I'm trying to remember back. I think there was one possible case of Triple E. Now um, that was nearby. I, I can't remember if it was a Manchester or Essex case. So I apologize for that. Uh, Triple E is not a joke. Uh, people can die from it. West Nile virus. Uh, anybody, myself included, and anybody in the room there, and anybody watching, may have had West Nile virus and not even known it. It could, you know, you basically develop uh, allergy or flu-like symptoms at its worst. Uh, generally speaking, there aren't too many people that I'm aware of that actually die from West Nile virus. So over the years, have, has, have the medications for triple E improved? And the reason why I ask is that I have to have a constituent who I was having dinner with a couple of weeks ago, and she worked in a medical facility here in the North Shore. And she recalls, it was, it was a while, it might've been 25, 30 years ago, but she remembers that a horseback riding camp from Essex, the, the riders actually came down with triple E and some of them did die. And um, so she kind of threw that out at me when I was saying, you know, I was concerned, I didn't know if we needed to do this. And she had that other part. So um, it was just kind of, I didn't remember that ever happening. Do you have any no, recollection of no, that? I, I apologize. Um, no, I have no recollection of that. My history and knowledge of it is much more recent than that. I would have to look through old files and see if that was ever actually the case, or I can talk to colleagues in Essex uh, because they would be the one who would be notified anyway. Okay, but you, and I will share the floor with the rest of the council now because I've asked my two questions. Um, council member. Uh, Councilor Groh is not with us this evening, but I know he attended your meeting and. As a beekeeper, he raised specific questions. I don't know if you were able to address how this, this uh, spray, if, if in fact it is sprayed, which tentatively it looks like it will not, but how that would affect something like pollinating bees and somebody's private uh, bee collection and honey production. Supposedly it will have no impact, but again, uh, Councilman Mart, I would have to, and if you're willing to hold on a second, I can uh, take a quick look. Um, let me check our website. And let's see, I apologize for the delay. Uh, let's see, there we go. Uh, the question is if I'm a beekeeper, should I take special precautions to protect the bees before or after aerial spring? And, uh, Probably my speed reading of this, but aerial spraying takes place at night partly to reduce the chance of negative impacts on honeybee colonies. However, if bees and congregate, bees are congregating outside the hive boxes, consider applying a cover to the hive entrance or over the en entire hive box using a loose wet cloth, burlap, cotton, et cetera, to prevent bees from exiting, thus preventing them from having direct contact with the spray during application remove the covers and additional boxes placed on hives as soon as possible 
in the morning. Um, <clears throat> basically, let's see, the product being applied has very short life, half life, one day, and breaks down rapidly in sunlight. Uh, the Department of Agricultural Resources has conducted monitoring of honeybee hives during past aerial spraying events and has seen no negative effects on honeybees. Thank you. You're welcome. And for members of the public, I just, as Max was going on to his system, I went on to mine. So if you go on the city website, you go on to department, and then you go on to health department, and on the left side, there's a scroll down. It's the first thing says COVID-19, the second says mosquito spring opt out. And all this information is right there. So it's really simple to get. And according to Councilor Rowe, who immediately opted out last week, it took him about three minutes to do it. So I think that for those of you who are concerned with this, it's a pretty easy process. And it also leads you to all the frequently asked questions which I think is important. And this is all controlled by the state and we're offering this information session so people know what their options are. So I hope that is helpful. So are there any further questions? Uh, Council O'Neill, and then we'll go back to Council Ridley. Thank you. Um, so we went from a low risk community to a high risk region. That's correct. Are we still, uh, as a community, are we still low risk? <laughs> no, it's an excellent question. As far as I'm concerned, absolutely. But it's we, we because a neighboring community had case or cases, we got pulled into it. Okay. So, yeah, but we have not had, I checked uh, when Kelly Highland was a public health nurse, I checked with her when we were talking about this last year, and she looked back and she couldn't find any cases. Uh, in Gloucester, you know, looking at our Maven records. So, so if I may, sure, um, so Rockport's a low risk community, so they're not in the same region as us. Is that right? Am I so, not understanding regionalization? Yeah, ex exactly. Essentially, because you know, they lucked out uh, by location and by the fact that we hadn't had any cases, they were considered a low risk community. Uh, excuse me, or, or yeah, not part of the high risk region, but part of a low risk uh, being remained a low risk community because we hadn't had any cases and because they're bordered and they hadn't had any and they're bordered on the ocean on the right. other side. Right. It, it's not because we got put into a different category this year than last year. Not not for any cases. No, oh. not not for any cases that have, were uh, happened in Gloucester. Right. And one more question. If um, if the state's going to spray, they'll give us 48 hours notice. And how will yep. we receive that? Will that be one of those automated phone calls from the mayor or from you? Well, that's an excellent question. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, it'd probably be worthwhile if we do find out that there is going to be spraying. Maybe the administration wants to, you know, you know, send out a reverse 911 to let people know that that's the case. But if they, again, for those that can, if they can go on to the website, uh, there are links there that uh, allow people to uh, sign in so that they can get notified automatically. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, uh, Council Wordley. Yes, thanks again, Matt. I appreciate your time. Of course. Um, so you said that you have fountains in your yard and someone suggested that you dump the water out. And that's assuming because birds would drink potentially from the fountains. We have a watershed, we have reservoirs. We can't empty them out and and put new water in. it just mm -hmm. raises a question of you know the seriousness of this could be could be pretty serious and so i want to encourage everyone to consider opting out themselves i know mayor Berger announced at our last meeting or one before that that he opted out right away councilor grow did i did i just council memhard council Margiotta. i just think as leaders in our community if we're deciding to opt out we should at least announce that to encourage other people to do the same thing. It wasn't hard. City website, a couple of links, a couple of clicks, and we opted out. So maybe the more people opt out, the less um, spraying we'll have. Risk so, Forgive me, Councillor Worthley, if I can. I would need to double check to uh, see whether or not watershed areas or in reservoirs specifically 
are automatically excluded as spray areas. Uh, I would imagine that they would, but as you had mentioned before, uh, or one of the other counselors, um, it can't help drift. And so it's gonna depend a lot on the wind. Uh, as they mentioned in talking about bees, it only lasts in the environment for 24 hours. As soon as the sun hits it, it dissipates enough and outgasses probably uh, to make it neutral. But it's an excellent question and we'll look into it. And it also goes with the food chain, right? Whether it be the um, shellfish or lobster, or if it's birds that eat mosquitoes um, mm -hmm. and the council that grow pollinating. I think it's something that, you know, I don't always want to be naive to trust government all the time. So I just want to raise the, the point. And if we can all uh, opt out or encourage everyone to do it, I'd appreciate that too. I think everyone would. Thank you, Max. But it, You're welcome. But I, my personal feeling is that it's a personal choice. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think, I think that we were comfortable. I'm comfortable doing that. I know that my family is most likely going to opt out, but I don't want to make that choice for someone else. We don't so, have a choice. Exactly. Right. exactly. I understand. Um, Max, it would be great if you could find the answers to these few questions that came up and then possibly update your website. If you would do that, I know you're trying to make this all the state information, but somehow you could get back to counselors so we can include this in our knowledge. Um, that would be really helpful. So, Absolutely, I'd be more than happy to. Terrific. And um, thank you for being here. And um, <coughs> is, is, is uh, our health director going to address the issue of the creek for us this evening? I, I'd, I'd love that without objection, counselors. <coughs> uh, can we allow um, through maps for Rachel to update us on the conditions at the creek? It's not on the agenda, but it's part of the board of health. Attendee. Um, so if we could bring Rachel in as an attendee, that would be great. Yeah, I, I see that she's in the audience and there she is. yeah, it would be, uh, it would, it would not serve the council well to have me try and uh, give you the background on this. Rachel has been the lead on this initiative from the get go and has done amazing work. And I appreciate the support of the administration and the council and trying to find the answers in relation to the pollution issues at the creek. Great. So, Rachel, can you hear us okay? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? We can hear you loud and clear. So if you could update us, that would be terrific. And we appreciate you joining us tonight. So yes, absolutely. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to update you. Um, it's been a pleasure to work with a council that prioritizes public health and environmental health um, as I do and as the department does. Um, I just wanna give a quick overview of what exactly we're looking for. Um, um, we investigate the pollution source and some of the results that we've gotten so far. So um, when we're thinking about what the source of pollution could be, there's three major possibilities. Um, first is that there was an infrastructural problem that was fixed over regular routine repairs throughout the winter um, and is no longer affecting the creek. The second would be um, animal activity uh, responsible for the increased levels of enterococci bacteria in the creek. Uh, and then the third would be an infrastructural issue that's ongoing. Um, uh, for example, a sewer line that has been compromised um, that is continuing to affect things um, and responsible for increased levels of human waste, which would cause um, the elevated levels of enterococci that we've seen. So <clears throat> with um, Woodard and Curran, our engineering firm um, that we've contracted to nail down which of these three, which of these three possibilities um, it is likely uh, to be. And we've been focusing specifically on uh, three different sewer lines, uh, one being the cross country line that goes from Neptune Place to Bass Avenue, um, a portion of Hart Street sewer line, and then a portion of sewer line that is um, off of Thatcher Road and near Witham, near the Witham end of, of Thatcher. Um, we've done lots of bacteria sampling so far. We've had to wait for the um, appropriate weather conditions to perform some of these tests. And we've also done some inspections of the manholes and the drainage systems and pipes so far. Um, and what I can tell you is that um, the Hart Street sewer line looks um, for the most part to be in good condition, functioning properly. 
We did find some abnormalities on that road and on Neptune Place. Neptune Place, especially being the um, yeah. Neptune Place off Bass Avenue. Uh, yeah, there's a cross country sewer line there. Um, the engineers observed um, a abnormal and peculiar amount of flow and discoloration at one end of the pipe. So that is certainly a concern. We're pretty confident that's likely a contributing factor. We won't know for sure until we see CTV that line. That will be happening on Thursday. Um, next, we did find some unexplained flow on um, a drainage manhole off of Thatcher Road. Um, it could be a tidal influence. It could, um, it could indicate uh, a compromised sewer line as well. Uh, we will not know also until we do CCTV the, the, based on some of the other factors, especially how where that line is located in relation to the swimming area, we're more confident that um, the Neptune Place line could be a contributing factor. So again, we will be CCTVing that line on Thursday. We'll know a lot more then. Additionally, we've been um, taking lots of bacteria samples. Um, I will say that the bacteria samples um, in the immediate vicinity of those sewer lines um, and where they cross the creek directly have been very low. So that either indicates that the problem has already been taken care of um, over again, like I said, routine infrastructural repairs throughout the winter, or that the, the perforation in, in the line potentially is farther down and is traveling through groundwater and meeting the creek at a later point downstream. Now, I did just receive some data from our engineers suggesting that downstream there is higher levels of enterococci, ranging from 300 um, colony forming units per 100 ml to 800 colony forming units, uh, which is quite uh, alarming because the maximum safe limit is 104 CFU. Um, and that is downstream closer to the swimming area. So it does indicate that likely the problem is ongoing um, and we'll find out more um, as time goes on. Um, and Thursday specifically will be uh, enlightening. Thank you. I, I just want to just make one comment then we'll open it up for questions, Rachel. So I understand from the mayor and from council members that the, there were signs that were put up was it yesterday? Um, around the creek area, no swimming. Okay, so um, can you confirm that, Rachel? So we're all we all feel comforted that the signs are up at the creek. Yes, absolutely. So on Sunday, when I um, learned that there were um, a high number of people recreating in the creek. I went to the annex and made some signs and uh, went over there and posted them and tried to spend a few hours educating folks on the risks of swimming in um, in the creek. We have not tested the creek itself. Oh, actually we have of as today, but we don't have those results. So we are, are um, the status of the actual swimming area is unknown. So I tried to make that clear and explain the risks to um, the folks that were, were at the beach at the time. When I um, arrived, at the creek, there was already signs posted. <laughs> um, and my ability, I can't erect signs, you know, these, you know, large metal signs that would be within DPW's responsibility, but um, we do post laminated posters, which is what I brought with me and which was already there at the time. Unfortunately, because they're small, people don't typically see them um, and they get taken down um, almost immediately <laughs> on busy days. But yes, on Sunday, I did uh, post additional signs. Great, the lifeguards will be back there this, will be there this weekend, which will be helpful too, because that can help <coughs> make sure that that's enforced. Hopefully I will say that- um, okay, right? If the results are okay, then um, they won't, the signs won't be necessary. Absolutely. If the if the results indicate that the problem has been resolved, um, then we, we will reopen the creek, absolutely. Great, thank you. Um, counselors, let's- open up the floor for any questions that we might have. Council Wordley. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel, for your presentation. Thank you for going in the office on a Sunday to notify people. It's very thoughtful of you. Um, My pleasure. You said, I heard 300 to 18, I'm sorry, 300 to 800 um, parts or units per, I don't know the math of it, but I heard you say 104 was the high safe one. Does that also mean the dangerous level? Like over 104 is dangerous. Is that correct? That's correct, yep. And so 800 would be 
eight times that number, pretty much? Exactly. Um, do we know what the consequences would be for someone who was infected or contaminated with 800 per unit um, contaminants, bacteria? Yes. Um, if you're exposed to enterococci through ingestion, um, the likely uh, consequences would be that you would maybe suffer a bacterial infection. Um, and that the severity of that depends on um, sort of your own immune system. Um, we are telling people to monitor their symptoms for uh, especially gastrointestinal uh, symptoms and also for um, dermatological rashes and to contact their doctor if they experience that after being exposed to enterococci. Um, any other questions? And then we'll go back to Council Worthy. Council Michelle. Just a simple question. Um, can we put a sign right when people enter? I'm not, I haven't been to Good Harbor Beach yet, but can we, like, where they enter, can we just put a sign right there so everybody that walk, drives in or walks in will see no swimming? There so is a sign can... right at the entrance of the footbridge. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, but the people don't. Or the driving part where they drive into. Uh, the unfortunately, the signage is out of my um, CPW. Yeah, that would be that was out of my authority, basically. Okay. Okay. And we're happy that Jill Cahill, our CAO, is on the phone. I was on the call, <coughs> so she's listening to all of this. So thank you, Jill, for being here tonight. Council Member, you're the Ward One City. <laughs> yes, uh, we get a lot of questions about this issue. People are very concerned, as you well know, Rachel. Uh, just to be clear, though, uh, at, at Last time we had uh, really serious testing results that were back in September, October of last fall. And correct me if I'm wrong, but weren't they up around 2000? Yes, uh, Councillor, the most recent testing that we've done at the Creek in the swimming area um, was in November. And um, I had done an extension of our regular sampling for about eight weeks after the regular season. And I believe the second to last testing event was in um, late October and it was over 2000 CFU, which is by far the highest uh, concentration of enterococci in um, recorded history at the Creek. And I will also bring up that we do have decades of, of this data. So um, it is showing an unprecedented rise in these levels. Thank you and, and you should, just share with us that by perspective, you, you, you have a background in Flint, Michigan, where they had a serious water problem. So you, you, you're, and you, you've been personally involved in this water testing at the creek. So you're intimately involved with uh, this monitoring project. I did, and I didn't work specifically um, with water quality in Flint, but certainly was an intimate part of my, my research there. And I will say my professional background is in um, waterborne pathogen outbreaks. So um, yes. Thank you, um, Council O'Neill. Yes, I thank you. Um, you said 300 to 800 colonies. Is that you? I, I just want to understand yep. what it is. The, it's, it's colony forming units um, per 100 milliliters of water. Colony forming units, okay. Mm -hmm. in this, in, again, the, go ahead. Per 100 liters of water, is that what you said? Milliliters. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else that hasn't spoken? Council Worthy, we'll go back to you. Thank you. Um, Rachel, this morning I had breakfast with someone. Uh, we went to Charlie's place. We got to talking about the creek. He says, you don't need to spend money. I've been doing this. I've lived here for all my life. And we, we all know the creek has been fluid. Look at me. I'm fine. And I got an eighth grade education, he said. And obviously, you know, there's a question of credibility on what he could present. Um, could you share with us um, what your bachelor's degree is in so we have some background on, on where you're coming from on this? Absolutely. Um, my bachelor's degree, I have a bachelor's degree in environmental science, um, and I have a bachelor's degree in economics and a master's degree in sustainability. So I think that I think we can all say with confidence, uh, Rachel's credible. Um, I appreciate that. So I have a question that's not for you. Um, but I have a second question. Who could answer this? We don't have legal representation at the moment, but what is the liability to the city? And I think that's a question maybe to come back to, ask the administration to ask our legal team, what's our liability in terms of the public being exposed to this? 
welcome to put in a request to the mayor if you'd like to get that question answered. Okay. Um, I don't know where I read this, but, and again, I'm not sure if Rachel or Max or Jill could answer this. I heard today that we're not gonna have lifeguards patrolling the creek. Can we, given this situation, have light, a lifeguard stationed on the bridge to patrol this? I can answer that. Hi, sorry. Um, I don't, I, I'm, just, I'm not sure where you heard that. And, um, but the, the lifeguards will be on Good Harbor Beach this weekend. They, they are, their job is to keep their eyes on the water. So their job is if someone's in the water in the creek, that's their job to make sure they're not drowning. So um, we have to be very thoughtful about not making them public uh, kind of beach police, right? Because their job, if they take their, if they're busy kicking people out of the creek, then they're not keeping their eyes on all the people in the water. Um, so obviously the lifeguards, as far as swimmers in the creek, will keep an eye and as they can, they'll definitely remind people to um, get out as, as needed. But their number one duty, and Tracy, I remember you saying you were a lifeguard, their number mm -hmm. one duty is eyes on the water and swimmers at all times. So, Ms. Kayla, you said you don't know where I heard that. I just heard it from you, though, that lifeguards will look at the creek and protect people from drowning. If they're swimming in the creek, and I think you're right to say their job is not to be policing that, I think we need somebody whose job it is is to protect public health and not let people go into the creek. And I don't care, and I do care, but if it's someone in an authority position like police, or if we have a parking lot attendant or two that's maybe we don't need as many this year because we're doing online reservations. Someone has to be responsible for making sure the message is clear. Uh, a sign, you know, not every child is reading signs and every child is being watched by an adult. So I think we have a personal and moral obligation to make sure people are informed. If they still swim, that's their prerogative, but if they don't know, I think that's, that's a problem. Jill, can I ask you, um, can I just ask you a quick question? Is, is it possible when, when the folks pulling into the parking lot, when they're um, driving in with their families, they have to go by someone that has the tablet, could, could they just mention to the folks that the creek is closed for swimming and just systematically mention that to the folks driving in to the parking lot? Just a thought. Sure, we can give it a try. Uh, but again, the, you know, that's not their responsibility. Informing the public about public health um, is very important, as Councilor Worthley first up, uh, pointed out. And we will, that's the purpose of public education. That's the purpose, purpose of getting information out. Um, but that's not, I don't want to be very cautious about putting additional responsibility for public health on the DPW and um, certainly enforcement. So. That's what we have a public education campaign for, and that's what Max and Rachel are working really hard to spread the word on. And the more the council can help spread the information, the better. Um, we will all be successful in it. We're happy to do that, Jill. And when you get the updates of the testing and you let us know, we'll make sure that we share that information, just like we always help with snowstorms and what other events that you have. So, um, and we always appreciate you first updating the city website so we can just use that information to share for a consistent message. So appreciate that. Great, thank okay. you. Any sure. other further thank questions? You, I see um, yes. Max has got his hand raised. So you're back on the big screen with us, Max. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Jill. Thank you for that. I just want to get back to uh, Councilor Worthley's comments in regards to his conversation with a constituent who longtime user of the creek, yeah, we know it's polluted, but I've been there forever and yada, yada. And I get that. Uh, you know, again, you, one of the uh, benefits of having longevity with the city is that I've seen the test results for 16 plus years at this point. I've tested the creek and all the beaches at one point or another uh, during my career. And yes, there are times, I, there are times it's, it's almost predictable. Uh, we do the preseason testing, everything's fine. Comes the season, then the the rates at the creek start to rise. Uh, and once in a while, once in a blue moon, we did have to close it because it was too high. Usually it was related to 
a particular circumstance, maybe at the creek itself, or there was a storm that churned things up and got bacteria to kind of rise from the surface. This goes above and beyond all of that. This, these are rates, as Rachel had mentioned, that are historic, that have never been seen uh, in the time that I've been here. And that's what raised the alarm uh, last summer and you know, prompted the administration and the council to move forward so quickly on trying to find a solution. And just to add to that, Max, if I may, um, we have publicly available data about the Creek um, weekly testing from the early 2000s. And previous to last year, we didn't see levels that were higher than, I believe, between 400 and 600 CFU on the upper end um, after, like you said, um, an isolated event such as a storm or another issue. Um, the levels that we've been seeing in the Good River Creek in the last year have been between 1,200 um, and 2,000. CFU. So significantly higher than in recorded history. We do have that data publicly available. Certainly it's been up and down. There have been days where it's fine. Um, it's a complex ecosystem, but um, absolutely the data would suggest that this is unprecedented. Thank you. So, okay, two more questions. Um, Council Harry, you haven't asked a question yet. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Max, for being here tonight. Um, Maybe you could identify where or will the city mark where the line of demarcation would be safe to unsafe. Obviously, the canal flows into the ocean, but someplace along the way, it must get diluted enough where there's a safe zone. And, and this might be for uh, uh, Joe Cahill. Would, if these numbers are unprecedented, Obviously, the, the signage, as I think everyone has mentioned, a majority of the people I think and I've seen are, are children and they will not be reading signs. Should we be erecting barriers such as what we have uh, on the dunes to keep people in the safe zone? Thank you. To speak to your first point, Councillor, um, the creek is as I've said, a very complex ecosystem. And we do see dilution occurring to an acceptable level by the time we reach Good Harbor Beach. So I'm not sure if this is clear, but we do have two sampling points at Good Harbor, one in the beach and one in the creek. Almost always, except for one time, at least in my tenure testing the beach, the beach is fine. The amount of dilution happening with the wave activity and the water temperature are both sufficient in um, creating a safe atmosphere for swimming. So it's almost exclusively the creek when there's a problem um, as far as Good Harbor goes, and that's because we do have standing water at low tide that uh, reaches extremely high temperatures for a marine ecosystem um, and not as much dilution because of the wave activity. So if that answers your question, typically once you um, at the mouth of the creek, when you reach the beach portion, uh, that would be safe. Again, the signage um, is not, would not be in our uh, wheelhouse. Thank you. Um, Max, go ahead. And then I think Council O'Neill had a second question. Thank you. Yeah, and just by way of follow up, uh, Councillor O'Hara, th that was actually considered last year. And we're even posting signs along the edge uh, just to notify people. It was quickly brought to our attention by DPW and Nature itself that for those who know, when you get a storm tide coming through, it's going to wipe out everything along that line. And so now you're dealing with, you know, what was meant to be a good idea is now a hazard to navigation out at sea. So you have to be very careful about the approach you use uh, for barricading, you know, the area. But it's a good idea. We did, we did think of it, uh, but, you know, we had to factor in that other consideration. Thank you, Matt. Council O'Neill. Thank you. Um, Jill, this would be um, directed at you, I believe. Um, just kind of following up with um, what Councilor Wardley and Councilor O'Hara said about um, just separating, getting people out of the water at the creek. Um, as a lifeguard, definitely um, eyes around the water, you're watching people swim. But if the lifeguard is keeping people out of the water, there's no one to watch swim. So, and so, but the, as a lifeguard, your first thing is safety, right? Safety at all, above, above all else. And so if it's not safe to swim and these levels look really unsafe, 
if it's not safe to swim, then that I would think that that would be the lifeguard's job is to keep the people safe because if he has to go in or she has to go in and save someone, then she's going to be exposed to those levels. And then it goes back to what Council Worthley said about liability. I certainly don't know anything about that, but um, I think that the, the prudent thing would be to have someone or do your best to keep people out of the creek if it's if it's unsafe. That's my two cents. Um, yeah, thank you. I mean, we will obviously, the intention is to do the best to keep people safe on the beach. I think you guys have, I hope you've seen that there's a lifeguard shortage throughout the entire Commonwealth. Um, and we will, if the Board of Health rises, raises this level of concern to something that says, we need all eyes on the creek, um, we'll consider it. Um, but, you know, our, the lifeguards first, and we, we have limited resources, we have limited staff, we're going to send you guys an update um, in the morning about uh, all summer operations. We're limited and challenge it in all areas, um, lifeguards being one of them. And yeah, we're going to, we will definitely keep safety as their priority. And as they can, they will keep kids out of the beach. But I really hope that you guys will help us spread the message of personal responsibility. There should not be kids unattended in the creek. Their parents should be nearby. Um, so there is a level of personal responsibility. We talked about this during COVID um, on the beaches. Uh, so this is a this is a piece that we've gone round about on the beaches for years, certainly through COVID. And so there is a level of personal responsibility that needs to be taken here. But to the extent possible, um, we will inform the lifeguards to keep an eye on it and get people out of out of the creek as well. Um, but again, we also look to the Board of Health for some direction in that. Um, as you said, the barriers and things like that it becomes litter. They become navigational hazards. Um, and so, you know, again, if 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 they rise to these levels, we're board of the Board of Health. They, we shut down beaches all the time. We shut down Pavilion on a regular basis. If the Board of Health needs us to shut it down, we'll shut it down. So um, just one more question. Go ahead. Um, I haven't um, been to the beach in a while. Do they typically, they used to have one lifeguard posted at the creek. Do they still have that? Or is there no lifeguard at the creek? Or I, I don't know what the, I don't know for this season yet because I don't, um, okay. I don't know. I know our lifeguard levels are, are high enough to staff the two big beaches. Um, but I don't know the exact number of lifeguards, but I can uh, follow up on that with you, Councillor O'Neill. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. And just a couple of comments as we can wrap this issue up is um, as Max commended Patty Page for the work that she's done in the past with mosquito control issues. Um, I'd also like to just shout out to Marianne Boucher, who also took a leadership role early in the weekend when a large bus from California came. And um, she just went very softly mentioned to the, to the folks, the, the chaperones, that it might not be a bad thing if they, the kids weren't wading or swimming in the creek. And the chaperones were very appreciative and she had a nice chat with them, welcomed them to Gloucester and it was kind of a win-win. So we're all in this together and um, I'm grateful that We've um, taken upon ourselves as a city council to support a $120,000 survey to kind of assist Rachel and, and the public health department in overseeing this because we realize it's important. We want to solve it. Um, so thank you for, for stretching your conversation tonight. And this conversation was very timely and we appreciate you being here um, to help us through it. So. Good night, Rachel and Max. And good luck with the testing this week. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Councilor. We appreciate the time. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next order of business, Matt Clark. We have uh, Rosemary back on. Oh, great. The attendees. Rosemary, so we'd love back. you to come on now. And um, if you've called in, if you can hit, see if we can bring you on. The promoter as a panelist again. Is there a phone number? I don't know. I see her number. I see her down. Oh, yes, pull up. Is it? Is that her phone number? 
Yeah. Rosemary said, is your phone number, does it end with 9114? If that's you, can you hit star nine so we can bring you in on your phone? Just hit star nine. That is you. You can. Oh, I, I think we're I here. Don't know, I don't know if it's for or not. If that is you, um, Rosemary, if you could. Um, I just brought her in, the we, person in. We brought you in. I don't know if that is you. Um, would you unmute uh, yourself and tell us if you're Rosemary? <laughs> so. Okay. I don't think it's going to work tonight. So, um, Rosemary, I understand that. You've been in contact with Council Memard, so if you wouldn't mind connecting with him. I, I, during Councillor comment at the end of the evening, I can update the Councillor and the Mayor's office about her concerns. Okay, great. So Rosemary, if you, I, if you can hear us, Council Memard said he would update us in the, um, the latter part of the agenda on um, the issues that you brought forward. So they will be addressed and reported to <coughs> city management so thank you oh someone has a hand up so that ends in 114 it's the same it's the same number hmm. she muted here we go hello we can hear you can you, can you hear me yourself? yes can you introduce yourself and your address yeah hi my name is rosemary loranger and i live at 74 thatcher road in gloucester um, and then basically my concern is that within the past three years, the intersection between Witham and Thatcher, you know, we, there's been three condominiums uh, built. And uh, as a result of that, we, there's, you know, more traffic in, at that location. Um, the, currently there is a crosswalk there, but we only can only see a third of it. Um, and we have, uh, you know, there's a lot of traffic that goes by and there's a lot of pedestrians that go by. And um, I would like to request that the existing crosswalk be repainted. And also if it would be possible to add additional crosswalks because of the 74 Thatcher, 78 uh, Thatcher, um, you know, we need to cross, to go to the beach and um, the traffic is pretty heavy and they drive pretty fast. Um, and it hasn't been easy crossing the street with children. Um, and with the summer coming up, coming up um, we just believe that uh, for safety reasons, the, all the unit owners uh, on the, those three corners, it would be important for us to have some uh, safety measures to cross the street. Uh, just in the past two uh, weekends, we have had two accidents right at that intersection. Um, so it is a concern for the residents, uh, but not just for us, but everyone that's visiting because they walk to, uh, they, they come from Long Beach to Good Harbor. So there's a lot of foot traffic there. Uh, there's also a lot of traffic, uh, you know, pedestrians going to for ice cream or even to the Surfside restaurant. So it's a busy, busy intersection. And we do see a lot of near misses and some of them are not misses. Um, so I just wanted to bring that, you know, to everyone's attention um, that, you know, uh, we don't want to see um, serious injuries occur during, you know, at that intersection. Great. Thank you so much for uh, sticking with us on this call tonight. And um, mm -hmm. really appreciate it. And um, just. Again, th thank you. Have a good evening. All right. Good, good evening. Thank you. Next order of business, Madam Clark. The next order of business is the consent agenda. Thank you. Um, Councilors, would anyone like to pull any matter off the consent agenda? I would like to pull off um, item number two under the mayor's report. Anyone else? I will tell you what I why I pulled this off, and then we can put it back to the consent agenda as amended and just take one roll call vote. 
Um, the number it is the memorandum from the veteran services director requesting acceptance of donation in the amount of $400. And I ask that we amend that to be $40. Shucks. So <laughs> I am, I'm going to make that amendment and we'll put it back on the consent agenda as amended. So, well, so we have a so we have a second on the consent agenda as amended. I made the motion, Council no and second it. So we have a roll call vote tonight to, um, that is Frank, Council Majota, you are first. So um, Council Majota. A yes vote means we amend it to $40, correct? And, we, and we're approving the whole consent agenda, all in one. Yes. Thank you. Council Member. Yes. Council Nola. Yes, unless Frank's got three of his key locks. <laughs> <laughs> Council O'Hara. Yes. Council O'Neill. Yes. Council Wordsley. Yes. Council Gilman. Yes. The yeses have it. Seven in favor, zero absent. Um, with gross and grow not here. Um, so, next order of business, Matt Clark. Is the new unanimous consent agenda. Thank you. So, tonight we have a unanimous consent agenda that has Two items. One is invitation from the Gloucester Fire Department Relief Association to the Firefighters Memorial Service on June 12, 2022. And that's for info only. And then we have number two, City Council to weigh in on the Massachusetts Municipal Association's recommendations on proposed Senate bills for the fiscal 23 state budget. And that is um, something that I have added and I'm, I'm requesting that we have a special meeting on Thursday from 3.30 to 4.30, a Zoom meeting with these matters alone on it. And we have included these in the consent agenda packet so you can see what they are and the public can see what they are. And I think that these matters are extraordinarily timely because right now the Senate is negotiating on these matters. And I would like us to be able to meet as a committee and make a recommendation towards our Senate and our governor and our house of reps that these are important to us or not. And we can go through those on Thursday. So with, if I would like to just ask before I put this back in the consent agenda, if there, if we do have a quorum of five that would be able to attend this meeting before the school budget review on Thursday, this would be three thirty to four thirty Zoom meeting. Yes. Council Nolan, Council Hara, can you make it? I will. Right. Thank yes. you. Council Majota is traveling. I will not be able to make it. Okay. Council Memar, yes. are you okay? Council Worthley. Council O'Neill. Yes. Council Gilman. So we have a quorum. Six. So thank you. So um, so I will then put the staff on the um, the consent the unanimous consent agenda and um, vote to approve. Move to approve. Council Nolan was my second. Thank you. So nice to be back in person, isn't it? <laughs> um, Council Majota. Yes. Council Memorad. Yes. Council Nolan. Yes. Council O'Hara. Yes. Council O'Neill? Yes. Council Wordley? Yes. Council Gilman? Gilman, yes. <laughs> the yes has happened, seven in favor, a zero votes. <laughs> Thank you. Next order of business, Madam Clerk. Is the Budget and Finance Standing Committee report of May 19th? Council Member? Yes, we have uh, two items in Budget and Finance. Uh, Jill, is, is uh, Sal here this evening to make a presentation? No, I, I did not ask Sal to come because okay. he was at BNF, but I'm happy to answer any questions. No, okay. I'll uh, just introduce this, and then if there are questions, you can uh, step up to them. Uh, the first item uh, from Budget and Finance is a memorandum from our Economic Development Director, Sal, Sal DeStefano, uh, requesting acceptance of a grant from the Massachusetts Office of Business Development, the City of Gloucester Retail Commercial signage district, district signage program city of gloucester retail commercial district signage program in the amount of one hundred thousand dollars 
And uh, Sal uh, gave a thorough presentation. We had a number of questions for him, uh, Councilor Gross, Councilor Worley, and I. Uh, and we voted uh, unanimously to recommend that the council uh, accept this uh, $100,000 grant for signage. Great, so would you make the motion? I certainly we'll would. It. Thank you, Councilor. Yeah. Budget and Finance recommends that the City Council accept under Mass General Law 4453A, a state grant from Massachusetts Office of Business Development, MOBD, and passed through the North Shore Alliance for Economic Development, Inc., a 2022 Regional Economic Development Organization grant program in the amount of $100,000 for the purpose of supporting Gloucester's retail commercial district's signage program. The grant period is from May 2nd, 2022 to May 15th, 2023, and there is no grant or in-kind requirement, and I so move. Second. Motion made by Council Member, seconded by Council Wordley. Is there a discussion, Councilors? Council Wordley. I may. Um, the vote out of BNF was two to nothing. I was part of the dialogue. I had to step off the meeting to attend a traffic commission meeting, but I would have voted in favor of it. And I just want to take a minute to explain the program. Um, first, thank you to Sal to Stefano for bringing this to us and its advocacy for it. The hundred thousand dollar grant is actually five thousand dollars per up to four thousand sorry up to five thousand dollars per business. And each of the businesses, and it's not just downtown. It's Magnolia, Lexington Ave, it's Rocky Neck. They then can apply for a sign. It could be a sign on their building. It's much like the facade improvement program where people are investing in the property. They may have a more expensive sign we would cover $5,000 of that. And I think it's something, I think the Chamber of Commerce is gonna be involved in advocating for it. And I also think the city is going to do a direct mail, a direct contact campaign to get even people who aren't members of the Chamber of Commerce to take advantage of this. And I think it's, and also the building inspector is involved in making sure the signage is relatively uniform. I think it's something we should support. And I just wanna draw a little more attention to it. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. The, thank you. The, 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 the grant is designed to help cover all aspects of signage so will include design production installation permitting and hopefully maintenance as well so it, it's a well thought through program according to sal there's some a good precedent for it in other communities great thank you any other discussion oh, also, oh yeah i just want to make sure that i understood that this but any and all businesses in the city of gloucester any and all businesses in the retail district. So I don't- What about the, cause it said commercial. So when I think commercial, I think waterfront fishing industry. Um, is that, would they be, if they applied for one of these grants, would the fishing industry or a processing plant be able to apply for one of those grants and actually get approved for it? I'd ask Jill perhaps to clarify that. My understanding were, were the downtown neighborhoods like Magnolia, Lanesville, and Main Street, Gloucester, but there may be a broader application. It's also it's a it's a you know competitive process, and uh, the applications can be up to five thousand dollars. So smaller businesses can also apply for a less expensive sign. Jill, yeah, I, I'm happy to answer there. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce is. Um, as our partner in administering this grant. Uh, we are very conscious and careful, especially having gone through some of the programs we set up during COVID to make sure the people who, um, that this, you know, that the city has a partner in, in administering some of these. So they're still working out the details and the fine, um, the fine print on what the application process will be, but the intent is to help as many businesses in the, um, it stems out of our downtown uh, local local rapid recovery plan. So the intent is to help as many kind of front forward facing businesses as possible. But I will certainly give your in, your input, um, Councilor O'Neill, to uh, make sure that we consider um, all the businesses on the waterfront as well. Thank you very much. I think they can use all the help they can get. Absolutely, we agree. Thank, Thank you. you. Very so important much. part of the uh, the you know we really think of downtown. And you're welcome to check out the rapid recovery plan. Yep. Um, it's we downtown is the from from the harbor all the way up to Middle Street, so they're an important part of that. Thank you for answering that. Go ahead, Councillor O'Neill. So the harbor would that include um, down the fort where those fishing businesses are? 
I mean, that's how that is definitely that is the area of the plan for sure included when all the way down to commercial street. But again, the fine print and the details around what a grant application is and how they grade them has not been worked out. And that would be, uh, but your input would be important is important and we'll include it. All right, thanks. And that I would contact the Kiffin Chamber of Commerce or should I just no, if you have input, it should come through uh, through city staff. Your input should come okay. to me and Sal De Stefano. All right. So thank you so much. Absolutely. Happy to help. Thank you, Joe. Council Majorta. Um, just so if when it's, if this gets approved by us tonight, like how how will businesses be able to find it? Or like Council Worley said, will not we, but some they'll be contacted. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So I will. Sorry, I'm not turning my camera on because I know I'm on that giant screen and I can't stand it. <laughs> I was in the um, so I am here though in present um because I saw what it looked like um yeah so we are actually there's going to be a number of ways we'll do a lot of advertisements so innovate Gloucester if you don't follow it on social media that is our economic development and community development um Facebook Instagram Twitter feed obviously it'll go all that way but most importantly over the next two days uh Sal and Ken and Peter and a group from the chamber others from the chamber are going to take a whole walk around downtown, um, and we'll get them out. We'll definitely get them out to the to Lexington Ave and Rocky Neck too. But this, in particular, this week, they're going to be walking and visiting all the stores because there's a lot of important information to get out, including this program as well as, um, as I've updated you guys a couple of weeks ago on the parking kiosk will be turned on um, this week. That's included in the update you guys will receive tomorrow, and I included it in the last mayor's report. So we're on schedule for Memorial Day. So um, it's really important to me and to the mayor that uh, our economic development director and ourselves are downtown and at the businesses and meeting people face to face. So um, they will be getting lots of visits in the next two days and uh, post that because priority right now is getting uh, the information also out about the kiosk and um, really training them to help us answer questions and where they can find information. And then after that, I will talk to them about getting out to Lexington Ave, Rocky Neck and, and any other parts of the parts of the community where they should be spreading the word on the signs. Thank you. Joe, would you just mention to um, us in front of the public that will be watching this when the kiosks are going to be working, the parking kiosks? Yes, they will be on on Friday. I believe it's 8 a.m., but Ryan is the person who pushes the button, so he can <laughs> he can confirm that. Um, the mayor is filming two different instructional videos. Um, I think Wednesday and Thursday, he's going to be on 1623 Studios. He's going to be on Good Morning Gloucester. We're working with the Gloucester Daily Times on the information you guys are going to receive tomorrow. I said, as I mentioned, we're going downtown, so. Uh, the parking kiosk will be up and operational on Friday. Great, and we'll make sure that we forward all the information that the city posts on the website to help get the word out. And I see Ethan Foreman is on our call. So the our writer for the Gloucester Daily is listening in on this call. Yeah, right he now. and Pam have been talking regularly. So, and we, I know Pam posted today about the app and the information about the app. Um, and I wanna, um, Shout out to our parking enforcement team. They are part of the solution, which is, is important to me. And they are also going to be working as ambassadors over the weekend and in the coming weeks to help people understand how to use the kiosk and how to use the app. So we're starting with public education um, so that people really feel comfortable and we have a smoother rollout. Terrific. Thank you so much. Can I ask you? Go ahead. Joe, can I go back to um, the EDIC and the, um, Sal and Ken and Peter going down Main Street? Um, Sal to Stefano, Ken Real of the mm -hmm. Chamber of Commerce. And Peter, what's his? Weber. Peter Weber. Weber also, the, they're all of the Chamber of Commerce, not the EDIC. Okay. So, yeah. But Sal to Stefano is not. <laughs> no, Sal is our, the city's economic development director. Right. He's the EDIC. Okay. No, so he's not the EDIC. CDI no. sees us as an appointed board. Okay. Sex. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, no problem. They're going to walk around downtown and what are they going to do? I'm sorry. They're going to visit all the, they're going to visit all the businesses and talk to them about the sign opportunity, about the parking kiosks. Okay. I want to say there was a third thing on Sal's list. So, I can't remember what it was, but just kind of updates on how things are going, you know, as we gear up for the summer and opportunity business opportunities to help out the, the businesses. 
Okay, can I find out when they're going to do that as the Ward 2 counselor? That might be a good thing for me to participate in. If and sure. when, because I, I don't know. If yeah, I don't know if they are going like as a group or if they're taking separate times, but I did ask Al Thursday, I think in particular, he has a time plan because I was trying to coordinate with parking enforcement. So, um, yes, I will loop you in when I get like a, a, a closer exact time. It will be obviously during business hours. So, right. Thank you very much. Absolutely, Counselor. Happy to do it. Thank you. So we have a motion and we have a second, correct? Okay. Um, so we can... Um... We ready to vote? Be clear? Yes. Okay. Council Majota. Absolutely. Council Memar. Yes. Council Nolan. Yes. Council O'Hara. Yes. Council O'Neill. Yes. Council Worthley. Yes. Council Gilman. Yes. The yes is having seven in favor, zero opposed. Thank you. Next order of business, Council Memar. The second item from budget and finance this evening again is from Sal De Stefano, uh, a economic development. Uh, Business Development Retail Pop-Up Incubator Program in the amount of $50,000. And, and I'll go ahead and read the motion so people understand what we have before us. But on a motion by myself, seconded by Councillor Gross, Budget and Finance voted two in favor, one absent, uh, to recommend that the City Council accept under Mass General Law 4453A a state grant from the Massachusetts Office of Business Development passed through the North Shore Alliance for Economic Development a 2022 Regional Economic Development Organization grant program in the amount of $50,000. And this is for the purpose of supporting Pop-Up Gloucester Retail Incubator, a pilot pop-up program held in a commercial unit in the building owned by Action Inc. at 206 Main Street. The grant per period is from May 2nd, 2022 through May 15th, 2023, and there is no match or in-kind grant requirements. And I so move. Second. Motion made by council members, seconded by councilor Worthley. Is there a discussion, councilors? Want to provide a narrative, Jeff? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, council Worthley. Uh, as the last one, I was at the meeting until they voted, I had to step off. I hate being considered absent, but I was very much part of it and appreciative of this and I would have voted in favor. So just so we understand what this is, it's a grant to help businesses get started that may later on be businesses that are stakeholders and property owners or renters but the idea is that you know when you start a business everyone here who's in business knows how hard it is this is to help get started i think there's a lot of resources that are coming with this in terms of legal and advertising and performers and all those sorts of things and a lot of people who go into business have an idea and they actually have no idea what it takes to run a business this is a way of helping them but also in a retail place i think this is where the community Impact unit was the Browns Mall. No, I'm sorry. It's the, the new building. The action. No, the, the new uh, Harborside yeah. Village retail downstairs. Sorry. So this would be a way for businesses to have some foot traffic as well as they're getting started. And I don't know that fifty thousand dollars is going to cover every possible need, but it's going to get some people started in business who may later be our downtown retail. So I absolutely support it. It's a fantastic idea, and glad that Sal brought it to us. Yeah, and it's an established program. It's going to be administered by Action, who owns the, owns the real estate there. And it comes, as Jeff said, with uh, counseling, uh, a lot of infrastructure, uh, so that different uh, tenants can try their hand at starting a new business. And they have it for a period of time. There is it going to be a competitive process again for people applying who want to try out this opportunity. And the hope is, that again, that they'll uh, get, be successful, a good number of them, and will move out to neighboring businesses on a longer term basis. Great, sounds great. Any further discussion, councilors? Roll call vote. Council Majota? Yes. Oh, did you have a question? Yep. I'm not sure where 206 Main Street is. I'm sorry, I should yeah. know that. Oh, Cameron's, okay, thank you. Okay. It's the Harbor Village building. Okay, I wasn't um, putting it. Together. They have a retail <laughs> space um, on, the for, on the ground floor. Right. Okay. And, thank you. Yeah. Yep. And, and it's a business incubator um, concept to begin with. So we partnered with them. All right. Cool. And we'll all remind each other that we have to start calling it Cameron since it's now the Harbor Village. Yeah, because I have so. no idea. I still call it Friendly's parking lot. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so let's do a roll call vote. Council Majota? Yes. Council Memar? Yes. Council Nolan? Yes. Council O'Hara? Yes. Council O'Neill? Yes. Council Worthley? Yes. Council Gilman? Yes. Yes. Seven. Zero in favor. Seven in favor. Zero opposed. Thank you. 
Thank you. Next order of business. Is Madam Clark. Is the Ordinance and Administration Standing Committee report of May 16th. We have no items under this head. Thank you, Councilor. The next is the Planning and Development Standing Committee report of May 18th. So I, um, we, we really have no official items except one very important item, which was that we approved the Horribles Parade for all the street closures. And the other thing I wanted to mention is that one of the items that was on that agenda was a, a preliminary discussion on possible outdoor dining for Main Street and other establishments for this summer. So I just urge the councilors that weren't there. Uh, Council Wardley was in attendance as well as, as um, <laughs> Council Denmark sought for Council Bro and Council O'Neill and I were there. And um, so the whole first part of the minutes, you will see um, a discussion that we had to kind of introduce the council order on outdoor dining. So I encourage you to read it. Um, Joe Cahill was there, as well as Bill Sandholm. And you'll see, it will, it will allow you to understand very quickly what was discussed and what the next step is, which is on June 2nd, they'll be meeting in front of the planning board that will be advertised as a public hearing. And then June 14th, they will be advertised the public hearing in front of us. So I think that's it. And but um, on that matter, go ahead. Can I speak about the Horrible Spray for one moment to add to your commentary? Go ahead. Um, I think a lot of people have long mistaken that the Horrible Spray is funded by the city. I think the city has been a partner at different times, but it's solely by fundraising. And they want to put on a great show and they're struggling. They will get there eventually, but I think um, it'd be helpful for all of us just to know that and encourage people to donate. I think after coming out of COVID, something like a nice community event, like a Horrible's Parade, would send a really positive community message. And I just want to use this platform to advocate. Great. So I'm glad Thank you, you proved it already. It's nothing for the council to do, but I want to make it Thank you, council. Can I ask a question? Um, how would they donate to the Horrible's Parade? I'm not prepared to answer that. But um, I can tell you. Yeah, talking, yeah, so. Do they have? They yeah. do have a Horrible's Parade website. Yeah. Okay, that's easy enough. Thank you. Yeah. Perfect. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. So next order of business. Um, next Clark? order of business is under other business is Ryan Knowles, IT Director, regarding hybrid City Council meeting update and the inter introduction of a post meeting Zoom public feedback survey as city council begins to transition back into in-person meetings. Great, thank you. Brian, would you come join us up here at the table? And I just wanted to take a moment to thank um, Ryan publicly in front of us <coughs> and the general public for all the support he's given us in the city council. And uh, we've been talking about hybrid meetings. What does it mean? What are our steps? What is it we can do? Tonight was the first opportunity for us to sample what it would be like getting back in person as a council. And then there are other hurdles that we have to go through. Um, and the hurdles are things that Ryan can explain to us so that we understand as a council what our options are. And, um, where we might need more technical assistance and how it is we're going to continue as a council because this is a decision of all nine of us to make it's not my decision it's not the old council who voted to support hybrid meetings with both members of the public and hybrid it's up to us as a council to determine what it is that we want and we each have one vote so ryan will um will update us on the options and then he's come up with this very cool um, Zoom survey that will ask people that are on the call at the end of the meeting to fill out so we can get feedback in terms of how um, you view the meeting. And um, do, you, do you want to start by going through that, Ryan? And then we can ask you to describe the different options for our meetings going forward. Yeah, of course. Thank you also for having me here tonight. I appreciate it. And <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, I appreciate this. Is, the meeting has been, I think, relatively free of uh, technical difficulty. Um, so for attendees, you should see the option to take a hybrid meeting poll on your screen now. I would encourage you to 
do so. Um, we will just leave it up as um, through the end of the meeting. Um, it has, it's very brief, I think it has four questions, three or four questions, and it's really just for us to gauge. So we're using some meeting technology here, which is relatively new. Um, you know, I think just from being here, the, the some of the, my end of the table, the angles may be a bit, you know, or a bit small here at the end of the table, but, um, but I think, uh, yeah, see, we're getting some results already. Great. Appreciate it. This is awesome. Um, can you just read through the questions just so we can? Yeah. Um, so the questions, the first one you should see is, did you have any difficulty hearing any portion of the meeting? Um, number two is, did you have any difficulty seeing any of the panelists? And then scroll down. Number three is, did you have any difficulty viewing any of the presentations? We didn't have any presentations tonight, so that obviously is maybe less relevant. And then four, compared to previous public Zoom meetings, would you say that the technical quality of this meeting was about the same or worse? Um, and so uh, we appreciate you know any feedback you have. It's anonymous feedback, so we're not going to be calling you up and saying, what are you talking about? Um, we're just we're just interested okay. in, I think we're gonna to try to have this, you know, on an ongoing basis. And I think this really helps us gauge um, what, how how our technology works, because in some ways it's actually a little tough for us sitting here actually to know, is this working? Can you hear us? I think, you know, the, the microphone's moving, the, we can see the video, but, um, right. you know, it allows us, I think, to be kind of nimble on our feet. And that's yeah. I think what we want to be, is that we want, we want public to have access. We don't want anyone to say, well, you know, could see you, but I couldn't hear you, or I could hear you all fine, but some of you I couldn't see, which is probably some, I would guess it might be the case, but. Um, yeah, that's great. That's really helpful. And just for the members of the public, in fact, we have 12 attendees right now. We've got Denise Pascucci, Ethan Foreman, Gary T, Jane Robson, <laughs> Jess Samaro, Samaro, sorry. Kenny Costa, of course, is our auditor. Karen, Mary Ann Boucher, Mary Santo, Pam Toby is our director of constituent services, communication, Patty Amaral. And I think that's it. So, um, so what we have everyone in front of us is we're not looking right now at our Zoom screens anymore. We're looking at us here in the meeting. And we're using our iPads only for to look at our packet, which is like 200 pages. We have to scroll through our packet. And um, so we're, we're trying this out. And I, I wanted to take a moment before Ryan goes over the details of what our options are as he sees it right now, um, just to mention um, that I really we owe a lot of thanks to uh, the Soya Free Library for allowing us to use this venue. Initially, they were talking about allowing us to use the downstairs friend room, and we felt that the ventilation was better up here. And, um, and it was just more conducive to even better technology. The, the connection here for Wi-Fi is just excellent. And um, they've been so accommodating to us. We had a preliminary meeting. We went through the walkthrough last week. Council member was there, Brian, um, Grace, our assistant city clerk, Joan, I'm Joanne Sinos, our city clerk, and Jill Cahill, and we kind of hashed it through and sampled how this would all work. So it's part of an ongoing process, but I'm proud that we tried to get out of our, our little cocoon of Zoom, which a lot of people loved, and we certainly had really good attendance at a lot of our public hearings. That's awesome. But now we get into a junction, and we eventually are going to have to start to get back in real person with people in the rooms with us. But um, so I've done enough of the chatting. So I'd like to ask Ryan to go through the options that you feel um, are in our discussion um, for, for future meetings. Yep. So, so I think as we've had a discussion about in the past, the governor's order that allows us to kind of have free, not free for all, but to have a remote participation in meetings, namely Zoom meetings as we've been having them kind of with everybody at, in their own kind of discrete location that ends on July 15th. Um, you know, we don't have any info right now as to will they extend it, they very well may, I don't know. But, you know, one of the reasons that I think Val really and uh, really prudently kind of said, and you know, Jeff and a number of others within the council said, let's start thinking about it now. Let's not wait till July 13th or whatever the next council meeting thereafter is and, and then say, oh no, what do we do now? Um, you know, um, 
let's start thinking about it now. And that's what I think today is. I think today in some ways is our first step, is our test dipping our toe into that world to say, what is it like first and foremost without getting into some of the more complicated scenarios? What is it like for the council to be in person? And to us to have something like a uh, you know participation with everybody else in the constituency uh, being uh, present via Zoom, you know, being present via you know more or less akin to what they have been doing. The only exception being we're all in the same room. So um, as a segue into what Council Gilman has uh, kind of requested of me, um, that you know this is option one. You know we can continue like this, and we can kind of continue like this as long as I guess the uh, that remote participation kind of uh, order is in place. Um, if that gets extended, we can continue like this kind of indefinitely and continue doing it like this, um, you know, with council in person and constituency via, um, you know, kind of coming in this way. We could also um, kind of flip it around and say what essentially that we do is we have everybody in person, council and the public coming in in person and we broadcast it, you know, we have it available via something like Zoom or, and, and probably even better via 1623 via the public access channel. But the one complication with that is that the most complicated portion, which seems like, which I know seems ridiculous, but I think as we discussed in the meeting, it really is the crux of the difficulty is having people participate remotely via Zoom in that kind of avenue. So, um, you know, as uh, uh, Joe uh, mentioned in that meeting, and as she's mentioned in, in other venues, if you if you as a council want to go back and have people come in in person and you want it to be broadcast so that people can view it but not participate from home, we could do that next week. It's easy. It's just it's not that much of a lift. The real lift comes when we're looking at having people being able to call in and be able to participate via a Zoom meeting. Because in that case. We get into a circumstance where we have to, you know, as you can see here, Joanne has kind of a spider web of wires connected to her computer over there. And that's what it requires. It, you know, in some ways it it should be seamless, but in other ways, it's just some of the technology still the gears are grinding a little bit technically. And so I think that that's one of the pieces that we've identified as being a technical challenge is that as much as I would love to spend every Tuesday night with that will start eating into the rest of my work week. Um, you know, I, I, listen. Uh, we, we did talk, or you talked people. about the staff requirements to support that kind yeah. of. It, it's and really so, adds a second person or even a third. Yeah, and so I think that you know that's what we discussed in this meeting with Council Doman um, and Mem Hard and um, um, Jill and Grace and Joanne is that this would in some ways require staffing, probably a technical person. You know, the library. You know, mentioned. Everything could work really pretty seamlessly tonight, but if this if that just shuts off, you know, and we're all looking around saying what can we do, um, you know, if I'm here, I could probably get us back in in 30 or 45 seconds. If I or someone like from my team is not here, then it's like a call and then probably one of us, you know, I've got someone on call 24 seven because we support the police and fire department, but, um, but you know, and they will come here, but it might be 10 minutes depending on where they are, you know? And so meanwhile, you put on your thumb saying, what do we do? You know? And so something technically goes wrong, you know, it's, in some ways, especially with this technology, this isn't something that you could say, oh, call me up, oh, pre try pressing that button, press that button, you know, you could try, but probably it requires someone being here. And then I think we also talked in some ways about on the clerk side, because really when you're talking about managing people coming in via Zoom, people being present physically, um, you know, you're really managing two meetings at once. You know, you've got to pay attention. Just think we, you know, we want to have balance that equal people feeling as though they have equal access. So if we want people who are coming in via Zoom to have the same level of access as people in the room, we don't want it to feel like, oh, if I was in the room, then I would have been called out right away for public comment. And then, but they ignored my hand for 10 minutes because no one saw it or not. So in some ways it really, it's really, again, akin to running and balancing running up two meetings. So I think on the clerk side, Substantial um, staff staffing, and I think that that's really what it comes down to. Is I think we, um, in some ways, you know, we, we have a really dedicated clerk's office, a really dedicated IT team, um, but we also, um, but that in some ways, we also are only three people, and there's only so many people that we can kind of marshal into some of these um, scenarios. So, I'm glad to you know, uh, field any further questions or clarifications on that. Yeah, no, 
And I, I just wanted to add is that my vision has always been that we invite anyone that could attend here that wants to be here. And by law, we have to be able to have a room size that is large enough to have anyone that wants to be here present here. And so that would, would mean, you know, 60, 70 chairs around the perimeter here, up, upstairs watching. <laughs> it would mean juggling when people come up to the podium for public comment. It would mean juggling, making sure that they can see the presentations up here. And then also that we can all see it. And at the same time, stagger it with people that are calling in and try to participate. So we'd probably have to alternate between people here and then people on there come around. And what the feeling is right now, after really, um, you know, a lot of the folks that Ryan deals with are from other municipalities that are sampling this. And it's, it's costing hundreds of thousands of dollars just to make a venue equipped to do all this. And we know that this venue is, if things go as planned for the library, this is going to be um, under construction in the fall. And then we have to decide where we're gonna go, even if we wanna continue like this, let's make pretend the emergency order continues. And it's one of the bills that is looking at being continued right now that we'll discuss on Thursday, if you take a look at the packet. So the Senate is trying to think about maybe this has to go on longer because COVID rates are a little bit People aren't dying, they're not as hospitalized as they were, but there is some concern about that. So we just have to be on the leading edge of knowing what it is <coughs> our requirements are. But we just wanted to be honest with you because this is not my vision of what we want, what I've always wanted to do. This, there are costs, there are um, health issues, there are issues of staff, and it's a lot of work. And, um, you know, we might find that maybe we could use a, our, our current funds for this because this is something COVID related. And I might go to one of those individual meetings and say, I'd like to see us become really techno, te technologically solid to be able to do this without worrying that something is gonna go wrong. You know, and um, <clears throat> that could be an option, but I'm only one of nine voices. And I just wanted to bring this back to all of us here. There's no vote tonight on it because we're not ready to get to that next step. But I, I'm, I'm comfortable with that we're trying. We've got a, an opportunity here to get feedback from the public. You can watch this meeting and, and say, could you see us? Could you hear us all the time? How does it feel for the people that are it's not a highly, um, there's only nine people here now, right now. So it's not one of the meetings where we have a hundred people, but we're, we're, we're figuring it out. We need to do it together. So Vine, do you have anything to add before we open this up to questions? Um, so, I mean, one, one other note would be, you know, in a scenario where we said, you're, you're there and the public's there and we're just kind of broadcasting it. I know that there's a lot of interest in being back in Kairos. That could also happen in Kairos. Because again, the complication of Kairos is really bringing people in. And what kind of also what Council Young kind of raised was this, you know, kind of shuffle of someone's at the podium. Can everyone, can they be heard and can everyone hear them and can everyone see what they're, you know, everyone in multiple locations see what they're presenting, all these pieces like that. Um, so that's one piece. So really, again, the complication of Kairos is really getting people remotely brought into Cairo so that we can all see and or hear them. Um, right, that's so, the kind of so the option, if we were to do that, we would go back, that's our home, and as city councilors, we would go back there, but we would, we would be limited to the type of Zoom technology we could do there because it's just not a good connection at all. And that's a problem. Yeah. And so we, could we could bring 1623 in and they could do the video taping like they used to when it's live so people can still watch it. But then the issue comes, the people that have loved being able to call in from home are gonna lose that opportunity. And that's, that's, the, that's the concern. That's why we have to weigh this all out and get feedback. So 
was there a, an option or a scenario that Ryan outlined where that city hall scenario would work, but people would have to make an appointment or to, to call in to be present to attend the meeting or to uh, ask a question or contribute? I recall we talked a little bit about that. Well, that would be for the exception person that might really want to participate in a public hearing and um, is, is unable to. Um, well, council always has that option under a law that we enacted about 12 years ago to do that. It just requires you to do a roll call and things like that. But, um, you know, I mean, that, that's, another, that's another option. Um, I think we, we did discuss that. I mean, in some ways, that's not that different, you know, other than technologically not that different from Zoom, and that someone's still probably from the clerk's office is going to have to monitor, even if people make an appointment, monitor a phone line. Coming right. In like one, of, one of your municipalities does yeah. that now, right? Yeah. People have to sign up. Is it North Andover, yeah. did you say? So, North Andover has that. So, if you want to sign up to speak at a public hearing, you have to sign up in advance. And you get a panelist invitation and you're on cue. If you can't do it at the last moment, you have to sign up. And that's kind of the control because it's it, it's there's a lot of technology that has to go on. Um, so let's open this up for comments right now in terms of go ahead, Council Miller. I'll be first. Um, I appreciate the library. I mean, this is a wonderful place to be. Um, I just think that. We were wrapped with technology, nothing against buying. Um, we're all looking for a way to keep people a part of things. And uh, it almost seems to me, um, and this is just my personal opinion, that we have a lot of staff here tonight. We have a lot of, of building being opened and resources being used for something that we could be continuing to do from home. But I think that the bottom line is to, have a, an input for the, the community on both ends to be on Zoom and to be in public. We have a technological gap there, but I, I love you all. I do. I love being out and about. But again, I think that we got to keep this building going. We got to pay people. We have the IT staff. We got security. We got cleanup. To me, it just seems that we're, we're better off staying home doing what we're doing until we can have an actual solution to what we're trying to achieve um and i know we're not voting on anything tonight and uh it's actually kind of nice to see everybody face to face but I, I i do think that right now it's kind of a, a waste of resources on something that was working before and um I think it, it, we're trying it, we're doing it, we're not voting on anything, but I think that the end result is the sooner we can get to a solid situation where we can have Zoom capabilities and in-person that coincide and work together, I think that this is, in my opinion, it, it's not worth the end result of what it costs for us to be here and to do this, to be sitting in the same room. And, Nothing personal. It's nothing personal. It's just my own opinion. I think we can achieve more and, and the less cost for the taxpayer to continue what we're doing um, in, on a platform that we're used to the technology we're working. That's just my opinion. Okay, let's share for um thank you, Councilor. Council Worthley, yes. Council O'Neill. So, firstly, the only reason why we're here is because we may not have the option legally to have remote meetings solely. So, that kind of forces the issue. And I want to give a lot of credit to the city staff, the clerk's office, to you, Ryan, for you know, we kind of were a little tough about a month ago saying we feel unprepared. I said we felt unprepared. And in a month, you got us here and it's working. And I really respect what you've done. Um, and I do know it's a lot to continue. I also want to give you credit, um, Madam Chair. It's hard to look at the screen, be prepared, call on people in person, call people on a remote meeting, and listen and respond and speak. It's a lot to juggle. So I give you a lot of credit for, for even trying to do it, and you've done it very well tonight. Um, you know, in a perfect world, we have options, and the governor maybe continues the emergency order, and we can make decisions from there. But I think we're in a good shape. It is nice to see everyone face to face finally. 
Um, and if we can make it work, ultimately, I think the goal is public participation, right? Safety and public participation. So as long as this isn't a super spreader event. Exactly, exactly. So public safety first, right? And public participation. I think you rose the challenge today. Thank you. Yeah, for those of you that can't really tell, we're all trying to be at least four feet apart from each other. So we're, we're, work, we're working hard to be careful. Um, thank you, Councilor. Councilor O'Neill. Yes. Um, thank you very much, Ryan, for doing all this. Um, so is it that Cairo's auditorium will never be able to have this technology, or is it because it's going to be remodeled that we can't? You can't. It, yeah, I no, mean, I, it's perfectly capable of installing the technology in there. Um, okay. You know, and, and really, and really, what I the vision for the technology in there is that it is plug and play. It is that, it's that it's really easy to use. Is that it's not. It doesn't take play. You know. Right. So again, two IT staff to be like, no, click that button. No, not that one. Plug it in there. You know, pull this down. Right. You know? So to have it kind of be that you come in and you set up your laptop and That's you run it and it works. Um, it's not there. Like again, even let's say the connectivity was okay in Kairos, it still would take a, a setup in there of a complexity level that certainly someone from the IT staff would have to be there each time. Just if, if something oh. went wrong. It just would be, I think it would be unrealistic okay. to ask any of you or the clerk's office to troubleshoot that in a way that would, you know, cause you to have to just stop, you know, so, um, okay. and, and I think that that's, again, some of the concern, even that, you know, I think, uh, Vice Chair, you know, Nolan kind of brought up too, just the cost of, you know, someone sitting there. Yep. Again, I mean, I love being here with you and listening to this, but, you know, I, I mostly sat here for two hours, you know, and it's, um, yep. and I, and I'm, Glad to, glad, I was glad to do it just to have, make sure that this went off well. But that's, you know, there, most of the time that's probably what it would be is that an IT staff person would be sitting there while waiting for the meeting to start and finish and probably nothing going wrong. Because, of course, the day that we said, I don't think we need the IT staff there anymore, why don't you not be there is the day that everything would shut off, that, sure. you know, the, everything would crash and burn. And then, oh. But, um, you know, Murphy's Law kind of stuff. But, yeah, so it's not that it wouldn't, it is never, but I think that also the call is one of those pieces that we identified the oh, cost, the benefit, yeah. you know, given that it would require us to kind of pull it all out and put it somewhere in the middle of the renovate it and put it all back in at some additional cost. Okay. Um, I have a question that um, has nothing to do with hybrid or anything, but um, a couple of people have mentioned to me that they can't see who is on the call. Do we have the ability? to let the, the participants or the attendees to see who's on the call with them or no? Oh, to see the other attendees. Yeah. Um, so it is, a, it is a limitation of the webinar feature we use on Zoom. It has some to do with, because webinars can have up to, you know, like thousands of people on them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they're used for things like a, you know, an actual webinar, you know, someone's giving a big seminar on this or that. They, you know, they have privacy concerns. So it's something that they kind of are trying to always balance where, you know, whereas maybe, you know, they, they don't want to have everybody's name. Everyone would be able to scan through and see who's on a call. So the only way to allow everybody to see everybody else on a call is to do a Zoom meeting, which then exposes us and has in fact exposed us to the possibility of Zoom bombing, which means that everyone who's on has the ability to turn their audio and video on. Oh, no. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, I, I don't, I, if you would like me to run through some, oh, no, no, no. some, I, some possibilities of what, what, what could occur. Okay. Because yeah, I've been on Zoom meetings yeah. where you could see and yeah. hear other people, yeah. but I didn't realize yeah, that I, I did have the ability yeah, to yeah, speak. Yeah. So, yeah, you can just unmute yourself and talk. So, okay. Yeah. No, that's, um, you know, you yeah, could, it could turn in. I, I, I believe locally there was a Beverly Board of Public meeting. Um, a, uh, you know, <laughs> the uh, the subject of which we'll leave, we'll leave unsaid for now, but um, yeah, where basically it, it, they had to abandon the meeting and it kept going on. It was, it was, uh, wow. it was embarrassing. Yeah. It was a disaster. So, okay, thank you. Yeah. We're not. But I read I read the people tonight who are here. Well, that's what I was going to We're, we're <laughs> not, no, no, we're not just, violating you know, people's if privacy. If there's 100 people, though, it would take a while, yeah. but we well, can certainly do that. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, no, that's, that's not. 
the reason I asked. I just, I people would like to know, you know, if they're the only one on the call, or if yeah. there's, you know, 50 people behind them. Yeah, right. You know, it's, um, but if they can unmute themselves for what they want, that's. Yeah. Yeah, it's like I said, it's unfortunate. It's a balance that yep. I think Zoom as a platform is not something that we turn on or off as a city. It's something that yep. the platform itself is a limitation of the platform. But they're trying to again balance privacy in some situations and in ours. Yeah, it would be nice to actually have that capability. But again, it's an international corporation. Okay. I could say, could you do that, please? And they'll say, sure, we'll, uh, <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll duly note it. We'll send it to the development team. Right, thank you. Who else um, hasn't spoken yet? Um, I again, obviously, thank you. Um, obviously, whoever is, everyone who's involved in this, this is um, it's great. It's also fun. I think this is our my second in person <laughs> meeting. Um, yeah. Jan Ray, Tracy yeah. too. Yeah. Um, but I agree with Councilor Nolan as well to um, extent of yes, this is very costly, and you know, so I sort of like the, you know. Until we can figure it out or, or we'll see what happens in July, this works. <clears throat> so we, this is a way to sort of do it in the future, but it is sort of, you know, I think more cost effective to, you know, have everyone at home until there is, you know, we we'll see what happens based on what the Senate does. So that's it. Can do that. Um, Council O'Hara, have you spoken? No, I have not. Thank you. Brian, thank you very much for your efforts. Uh, yeah. Very well, much appreciate all the way around today and everything you do for us. Sure. So I can, for one, I can tell you I have all I can do to turn this thing on. <laughs> you know, thank you so thank you. Um, I have to support 100% of what Council Nolan says. Um, you know, we're here to govern the city and um, we're voices of the people, but we also have to look at the bottom line. Um, and I think that, you know, as everyone said, um, and we all enjoy being here, but it comes with a cost. And, uh, you know, safety is very important. Um, you know, protecting all of us um, and, you know, full transparency to the public. Uh, we, we all, I think our platforms, we all want to see full transparency. And I think we've seen that in our prior meetings. Uh, we've had hundred of people at midnight. <laughs> I can honestly say I've been a city councilor now. This is the seventh year. I could say a meeting that would start at seven o'clock. If we had a hundred people at seven o'clock by probably eight thirty, we'd be looking at twenty-five people. So we 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 have the public's participation, which, as as I say publicly, if the public was to participate as they have, this city would operate differently. And I think we've proven uh, through technology that um, things can happen. And, um, you know, I, I honestly, you know, what we've been doing uh, has worked. I'm very pleased with it. I think our customers, being the taxpayers, are extremely pleased with what has happened. So with that said, I am, I am a firm believer that, um, you know, we should continue in the, in the prior form uh, versus what we're doing now because of the costs. We, I, I don't think we're gaining anything, but we're, you know, this is costing the taxpayers money that is, is wasted. So with that said, I'll pass it on to somebody else. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Councilor. You're welcome. I, have counsel one thing. I think I'm hearing something that I had anticipated, which is, do we have a capacity to Tell the governor, not tell, but have a resolution of some sort, some sort to advocate that we like the technology and that we can continue working remote. Do we have, is that something that has any value? Well, one of the bills that we'll discuss on Thursday, I, I mean, we won't be able to spend too long on it, but I'd ask you to read it closely. Um, that's part of the continuation. And mm -hmm. I think whenever, that something is being looked at as a continuation, it means that other people are starting to think there could be a benefit to this. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's all part of the give and take right now. And I think it would be easy for us to ask Ann Margaret and Bruce to come in, Senator Tarn and Margaret Fronte, our, our rep, um, to chat a little bit more about how we're feeling 
and, and get their input in terms of what they're feeling, what they're hearing at the state level. Is that that's all part of our legislative role, right? We we want we want to do what's best for the taxpayers of Gloucester to feel included in the process. And um, you know, it's kind of a this this was a, a this was a trial, and we're not going to stop it next week. We have to we have to phase out if we're going to go back to the other thing, right? Um, because we have public hearings that we've noticed, and there's just there we, we've agreed to start at seven our major meetings now because that's the time to meet in person. So um, you know, but we'll do this together, and we'll we'll see what the state comes up with with this new extension, and then we need to keep in mind what's happening with COVID. You know, I mean, we don't want a super spreader if we have. 60 people sitting here and we're having a meeting and it's a public hearing and everybody's going up to the microphone and you know we have to be very mindful of that too so um so council member just I, I agree with what we've been talking about here I, I think it's forward of us to be prepared i think this has been a worthwhile exercise for, for our just mentally to put our our heads around what these options are for us i think that's very wise of us to undertake uh the expense of it doesn't justify itself at this time. And if the state uh, does, does not extend their emergency order allowing this type of meeting without further changes in the legislation, then we're that step closer towards being prepared to make that transition if, if we don't have the, the, the option of remaining in purpose and uh, remaining remotely. I would say that during the zoning meetings, there were consistently a number of comments and people who, who felt that our our level, you know, I don't believe this, but they said they felt that they didn't have a voice because they were present, not face to face, but remotely. There were people that consistently said they didn't feel we were having a real meeting unless they were able to be present face to face. I think that's an interesting point of view because I agree, as Jamie stated, that we clearly had infinitely stronger uh, participation overall, but some people don't trust that they, 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 they are used to being human beings face to face and they think that that's part of the public process and that operating remotely on Zoom is somehow denying uh, their participation at some level or another. I'm glad we've taken the step. It's been very informative. It helps bring it down to earth and some concrete issues that, that, that uh, Ryan has spelled out for us. So we really we've learned a lot about what the choices will be going forward. Absolutely. Anyone else that hasn't spoken like to speak? I, I just okay. pretty much agree with what everyone said. I think the Zoom meetings are working very well, and this is an expense that's not necessary at this time, but I'm glad that we're prepared, thanks to Ryan. And that's about it. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll, we'll plan on the next few meetings through June. Um, same in person here, because we'll be feeling out what's happening at the state. And um, I think that that's helpful. And I just wanted to add one thing that we really haven't talked about, which is really important to me. I love the Zoom recordings. I think the Zoom recordings are a benefit to every taxpayer in this community. And I believe the Zoom recordings make us be better counselors because we can go and listen to what was said. Um, we can do recordings and the minutes of exactly what was said um, without a transcriber. You know, it's, and we get to, we get to watch what other departments are doing that are advisory boards to us. So that's 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 something that I believe that was probably one of the only silver linings mm -hmm. about COVID that I felt is that transparency of definitely. You know, it just it's one thing to see minutes of a meeting that you've gone to, but it's another thing to go back, see the minutes, but also to watch exactly what was said. And I think that's a benefit. So Deep down, I'm hoping that the Zoom technology is something that we can continue. Um, it comes with costs, but um, yeah, you know, I, but it's, it, it's how we integrate it into the whole thing. Right? And it's in my budget for the next year to continue the Zoom the way that we have. Um, we will still have recordings, and even if we had to do some circumstance where we just couldn't make it work, or we only could do something like you know, people kind of just viewing it we can still retain the ability to record. That's not thank you. 
So I think we've exhausted this conversation, but I think it's been very helpful, Ryan. Thank you. Jill Cahill, thank you for being on this part of the call too, because I know um, our conversation affects you in many ways, um, as well as the city with our boards and commissions. Um, even though we're a different branch of government, kind of all in this together, and we're, we're working through it. So thank you. Ryan, thank you for the time. Appreciate it. So, um, so for those of you that are looking right now at the survey, we'll uh, we'll make sure that we capture this data, and maybe uh, could we put this at the end of the agenda of the minutes? Could, could yeah, we summarize we'll, yeah, that? We'll, we'll have an output tomorrow. Okay. And could, could we throw that as a supplement to the minutes because it's not really we haven't really discussed it. How can we how can we get the summary of what people said into the content of tonight's meeting. Well, he would have the survey results. Yeah, so I'll have the survey and I can send it around to you all tomorrow, like just so you can see it. And then um, I can certainly compile them and send them to you to include as part of the minutes. Sure. So, okay. Well, sorry. Yeah, you just you get a good view, but, you, but if you want to see yeah, it, so and, 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 then, it and then we should. We should continue to do this at the end of our meetings and see and, and, and test it. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Brian. Of course. Appreciate it. Thank you to Grace also for being here to um, to watch our first in person meeting. Um, and Joanne, of course, for all your hard work. Okay, I'm just trying to figure out and remember for the next meeting where all the <laughs> what to plug in. <laughs> Um, next order of business, Madam Clerk. It's an update on the Council on Aging Board and the Dogtown Preservation Commission by City Council Representative Council Val Gilman. So I'm going to be quick. My first, I have two boards that I represent the council on. Um, one is the <laughs> one's on the Council of Aging on on aging, and um, I would just. I would just like to say that the Council on Aging is, is really vibrant these days. And there's a lot of good staff members that have a lot of energy. We have a new outreach coordinator. We've got uh, people helping people to shine there. Uh, Senator Tarr going in for monthly <clears throat> meetings. We have lunches. We've got all types of events. One of the one of the great things that I've been loving is that the leadership team at the Council on Aging is, is looking at ways to bring the outlying groups of people in the community into the mission of the Council on Aging. So we've invited them, for example, to meet with the folks at Lanesville Community Center to talk about how they might be able to bring some of their Zoom sessions out to the branches, like. Lanesville Community Center, Magnolia Library, um, getting more people in remote locations. So that's something that we're really looking at expanding, which I think would be wonderful. So it shouldn't just be that center. It's rather, how can we really reach out to all the folks that are want to age in place and to make them benefit, allow them to benefit from all the great programs at Rose Baker. So it's really cool. And I'm proud to represent Council as an ex officio non voting board member of that group. So that's number one. The second is uh, my role in the Dogtown Preservation Commission. And there were just a couple of things that I wanted to remind everybody about. Um, I've actually only attended uh, two meetings since I um, was appointed on this um, Preservation Commission. And namely, right now, the things that we're working on includes mapping of Dogtown, and we're also looking at alternatives for the compost facility. And we realize that that is a long-term process. It's nothing that we can do overnight because whatever we do to find alternative places for the compost regards, it's, it's, it's gonna cost money. And that is definitely sensitive, but we're also very mindful that Dogtown um, in the whole compost area is on conservation land. And um, it's where the trails start. 
and that is something that we're trying to think of some remediation of how we can start looking at different ways to compost and maybe take some of the yard waste that we have. We have seven such seven um, times a, a year. People can put their leaves out and their sticks and it gets picked up, right? And it all goes and gets put in the compost area at Dogtown Road. And the piles are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, sometimes some almost as high as the ceiling. And you know that the compost isn't always clean compost. There's some bags and debris and salt and whatever. Um, as Noel Mann has said, we can't really use that for anything other than rhubarb if you go and try to use the compost out of the compost center. So um, the, the Dogtown Preservation Commission um, made a proposal that for $16,000 a year for DPW increase their budget, they could extend the contract that JRM has with the tipping fee because JRM allows us to use them to find another place for our yard stuff seven times a year. So that's where that number of 16,000 was. It was the amount of seven times the amount that they said they would charge. And um, administration did not feel that that was a good use of DPW funds and um, didn't approve it, but it did start a really good conversation about how we might be able to do a better job with composting, how we could look for other places in Gloucester that might be able to house something like this. Um, nothing has to happen overnight and everything comes with a cost. So we're working closely with Mike Hale and um, Adrian Lennon on the front home has been our agent has been on this coming to all the meetings and we can meet in the city administration. So those are the major issues that we're focused on, on the Dogtown Preservation Commission. And it's a, it's a group of really good volunteers. So I urge you to, to sit in on a meeting. Cindy Dunn is the chair, she's an attorney. She's a great volunteer. And um, it's, it's a very vibrant, active group. So right now we're doing best practices. We're all taking, I, Mike Hale gave us a list of a way we can get all this information. So if we can't use CPC funds to do this survey, we're gonna to try to get the information ourselves. So we've identified 15 municipalities on this website that Gail gave us, and we're gonna start going out and visiting all these places and find out how much does it cost you? How do you do your compost? What can we learn? And we'll come back and report it. We're completely advisory. We don't make any decisions for the city, everything ultimately comes through city administration as that board does reports in. And, and then any decisions are always come back to, to being part of things that the call under our purview. So it's, it's a good process. I'm happy Jill Cahill is here um, sitting in to the end of the call just to hear this because she's been actively involved. And um, I think there's good, a good harmony, good excitement here. So that's, that's it for the DPC. Does anybody have any questions? No? Actually, one question. If yep. we were to ever contract with someone to take our compost, would that mean that the residents couldn't treat, if we, you know, if there's a one part of the compost facility, people get soil out of it too, right? Right. Well, that, that's, that, that was would go no, away. That was Noel's comment that the compost <clears throat> that we have in Dogtown really is, is not a rich compost. It's, it's, she always said that it would, she would, she would wonder if she could even grow her rhubarb. And she's, yeah. she's a naturalist. She knows what, what you could grow. And she's up there a lot. So, so if JRM were to take it, we're not really losing anything because the compost is a high quality. Is that what you're saying? They're just trying to look at a way that gradually we could start getting rid of all the hordes of stuff that's stashed there and doing something other than just stashing it there. It's just, it's a baby step. And, and we, didn't, we didn't approve it. The city did not want to put that money in the budget. And I, we, we respect that, but we just want to keep thinking of other avenues to take. So that's clear. Council Member? I just wonder if you all have discussed or looked into the possibility of partnering with the Black Earth Faller folks that are based in Manchester and have very successfully expanded their regional 
scope, their, their main facility, which they put a lot of money into uh, is, is in Manchester. And I don't know if they would be a part of the solution in terms of, of receiving Gloucester uh, yard, yard waste and uh, leaves and that sort of thing. They do have a finished product that they, they review and they chemically analyze it and they balance it appropriately. So in fact, it is better than free rhubarb. Um, I think I think we're open to any ideas, and like I said, we're just an advisory mm -hmm. group. And uh, but but I, I think we're open to anything. So thank you. And I looked into uh, black earth compost for my own personal use, and I found them very expensive. So. Well, this first group of best practices we're going to look at will be interesting. And when we pull that together, I'll make sure that I share it with all the consors. Look forward to it. Great. Thank you. Um, O'Hara. Um, I'm appreciative of the seven pickups that JRM and the city has, but the compost facility is used. You go up there on a day weekend that it's open, I think it's one to, once a month. It's open from what, nine to three, I believe. You'll see non-stop vehicles bringing in their cuttings and clippings oh, yeah. and what have you, and so that that's probably the biggest asset to the taxpayers, right? Exactly. Because JRM picks up you know, one one bucket or the bag leaves. Exactly. So uh, I think we have to look beyond. Absolutely. You know, where we we have limitations, uh, the the. Uh, recycling or the transfer station on Condolin Road has been restricted. We're putting clamps on, on our taxpayers right now that are costing our taxpayers to dispose of waste right now. It's, I think, where, you know, it's near $300 a ton. And then they, you know, the, you, you have the expense of dumpsters and what have you. Well, we have a major problem. We have a major problem, not only in the city, the state of Maine just restricted uh, waste from being moved from Massachusetts into the state of Maine. Yeah. Um, we we have a huge problem that we can't just shut down everything. These people, it becomes fire hazards. People are, you know, just stacking it on their property, putting it in a corner. And uh, I, I think we have to look beyond what, you know, what we're looking at right now. And we're lucky that our contract with JRM last for, I think it's another four or five years. So we, we went into a long-term contract, which was very helpful for us to have because of what's happening in the industry of recycling. So anyway, all right. I think I've talked this one through and um, those are my things to report. Um, next order business, Madam Clark. Is council's request to the mayor. <clears throat> okay, so let's go and roll call. Order. Councilman Jones, you are first. I do have a couple um, items I will be sending out um, probably tomorrow. Okay. I'm just working on the final emails and just have a few more questions on how to word it and okay. get it done. Uh, but I'll be sending those out very shortly. Great. Thank you. Um, Councilman Mahar, you next. Uh, I had two items for the mayor's office. Uh, one is to just follow up on the comments by my constituent, Rosemary. Lorangan, who is at the, at the, in the new condos there at one corner of uh, Thatcher's Road and with them. And, uh, you know, there was a crosswalk, crosswalk there that uh, had been repainted about three or four years ago. Uh, the utility construction in the neighborhood uh, removed a good part of that crosswalk and it has not yet been repainted. Uh, but I, I think what she's really asking for is more than just the repainting of that existing one crosswalk that. Uh, there's a lot more pedestrian traffic based on all the new homes that have been built there and people uh, there's there's not any safety for people trying to cross Thatcher Road on foot and so it needs a pedestrian crossing sign and it needs more than one crosswalk. Um, I've had this, a similar request. It's a little more complicated because it's on Eastern Avenue uh, by Barn Lane. There are all those new homes, duplexes that are up on the hill. People residents and their families are crossing the road to try and get to the beach. Uh, the difficulty on that location is that um, besides Eastern Avenue being in partly a state highway, um, the landowner on the far side, the, the, the uh, Shaw's Plaza there does not have any sidewalks and they own Barn Lane. And 
the, the city of EPW can't put a crosswalk from their sidewalk on the other side to a place that doesn't have any crosswalks or is on private property. So th there's some issues there and, and I've re I reviewed them a little bit with Pam and the, the DPW, but those are, those are challenges. The, the other thing that I'd just like to bring up is again for the mayor's office, um, the, uh, the manhole explosion last Thursday morning um, was, a, was a serious wake up call, I'm afraid. Um, I still don't know what the result of that electrical fire and explosion and fireball were. Um, it wasn't clear when as Joanne was trying to evacuate her share of City Hall. I mean, I, th I think people came out and they went toward the manhole fire uh, because it was a curiosity item. Um, I'm just concerned about our protocols for safety and evacuation uh, and notifying within City Hall, which is a huge building with offices throughout on the little warrens up and down and up and down. Um, I talked with Maggie Rosa, who's head of the City Hall uh, Preservation Committee. Um, they have funding set aside, as we all know, we, we, we've talked about part of this update of, of uh, our Zoom capabilities in Cairo is we're waiting for, and attending her meeting by, Zoom, by following up on Zoom and watching her and Bill Sanborn and Steve Dexter and others uh, talking about the issues, talking about the existing money that's been spent, the plans that have been developed that now need to be updated for uh, the infrastructure, the electrical systems, the fire uh, suppression and alarm systems. Um, it's a big project and they had hoped at one point that they would use the 400th anniversary as an, ex they wanted to get going on progress and sort of stir it all up and so that it couldn't be used. So it got a lot of public attention because they, they need additional funding, but they need some real pressure to move ahead before they have another serious accident that closes City Hall. So the City Hall Preservation Committee, City Council, we all just need to be cognizant of the issues there that are that are that some of our volunteer uh, boards and commissions are struggling with, and the mayor's office is struggling with as well in terms of prioritizing. But we need to do all we, we can to support those efforts. Great, thank you. So next we have. Councilman I've got nothing tonight. You've got a work meeting that you have coming. That's up. I do. I do on Wednesday next week. Thank you, Library. June first, six o'clock. Open forum. Open forum. Great. Thank you, Councilman Perfect. Thank you. Uh, first, I, I want to thank uh, everyone for being here tonight. That's great. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you, Grace. Brian, great job. Uh, Yesterday we had a, a blood drive um, and I want to thank my counselor to my left, Frank, uh, and his wonderful wife, they donated, uh, Councillor O'Neill, Councillor Gilman, thank you very much. Um, it was a, we had a joint collection. We had both Dana Farber and Red Cross present. We collected uh, a total of 56 units, um, which is a small fraction unfortunately of probably what was used in an event such as what happened in Texas. Um, there's a tremendous shortage of blood in, in the New England area. Um, and God forbid things happen and we don't have enough blood to, to keep, keep people going. This is an event, that again, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of units are used. Um, we have another collection on next Thursday. June 2nd, uh, it's a, a joint collection. Uh, and um, if people need to be asked to donate, consider yourself asked. And I ask everyone to help me reach out and uh, find donors. It's painless. I think Council Majota, Council O'Neill, Council Gilman can say it's, it's painless, it's fast, and when you leave, you feel awesome. Um, so uh, next next Thursday, June second, uh, it runs from eleven to seven between Dana Farber and the Red Cross. And if that day doesn't work, we have on uh, July on uh, June seventeenth, June twenty seventh, on uh, July eighth, and July twelfth. So there's plenty of collection uh, that will be happening. Everyone's allowed to donate every 56 days or eight weeks. 
and uh, again, it's it's an awesome feeling. So we also have New England Organ Donor Bank participate in the blood drives, and they uh, they educate people on the the uh, the need to think about donating your organs. Uh, the need for organ donation is is huge, and uh, they're typically present at the collection. So uh, help me help everybody uh, by spreading the word. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks Thank you. for all yeah. your leadership, Jamie. It's amazing. <clears throat> Next up is Council O'Neill. Uh, requested mayor, I uh, don't have them prepared, so I. Uh, Rather send out an email tomorrow. Yeah. That's okay. Just get them to the clerk's office okay. and uh, Sherry will take care of that. Thank, Thank you. Council yeah. Worthley. Sure, just a few. Um, I'd like to just add to Council O'Hara's work. I just let him know how much this means to everybody. But you were telling me a statistic of, I'd like you to share with us. Go to the top three, you're the top three donor location in the state. Is that right? That's right. Can you? Tell us who's number one or two. Yeah, Gillette Stadium is number one. Boston Gardens number two. And Magnolia Library is number three. Here, here. Wow. I think that's probably not one person who single-handedly led that in this community better than you have. And so I give you a lot of credit. But to be in competition with Bob Kraft and be that close, I mean, that's, oh that's impressive. God. Very impressive. A <laughs> um, couple of requests. The um, sign at the rotary uh, needs to be painted if we can. Bring that. I know there's a billion priorities. If we can prioritize that, it'd be helpful. Um, I think this was that. Um, Council O'Neill and I had put in a request to remove the sidewalk in front of Our Lady's Good Warriors Church. The sidewalk, sorry, not sidewalk, the crosswalk goes across Prospect Taylor and it goes to a curb that's not cut. And there's a curb cut 30 feet further down that leads to a ramp in the church. And where it is right now, it takes up the space where a hearse should be. And so now the hearse is parked on Taylor Street and it just gets a little complicated. In front of the fire hydrant, even. Right. So I just want to, I don't know how, what you do to move a crosswalk. I think paint thinner or some sorts, um, repaint it. I, that's not my specialty, but I just want to draw attention to that again. Um, back in January and in February and in March, maybe April, I requested. Um, Backyard Growers is looking for to expand. I think everyone knows here the work they do to provide food for the most vulnerable of our population. They've been looking to expand and I've been asking for a while to get a list of public property to be helpful to advocate for them. And um, so this will be my fourth request. Just want to draw attention to that again. And that's it. I, it's nice to see everyone face to face. Um, I know this is complicated in lots of ways. Thank you again for the staff for pulling this together, but it's good to um, communicate together. Thank you, Councilor. And I'm at the end, so I just have a couple of things. I took a tour of Lane's Cove two weekends ago with a group of about six abutters, and there were a few things that I needed to um, to get action on. Um, one are some potholes on Lane's Cove Road, which is actually a public um, road that gets goes out there, and there are a couple of huge potholes. And doesn't have to be anything fancy, um, but we just need to get those filled. Um, There's steps at the beach going down from next to the fish shack down to the beach that um, are in poor repair and they will need to be fixed. Um, and there's also a an issue of Plum Cove Beach at the steps going, the one or two steps that you take to get onto the beach from off the road. And I had a call from a constituent who, whose husband is disabled and he really struggled getting down the, um, the steps. And she was hoping that um, maybe there could be some weed whacking on one side um, to, to, to clear out that handle that you could get down there um, or long-term they do need to be repaired. So those are just a couple of things that are happening in Ward 4. And, um, and also through the mayor, um, Jill, it'd be great if I know that our DPW department has a schedule for painting 
for painting all the crosswalks in the community. And if, and if they could give us just a schedule, that would be some important information that we could give our constituents when, when they start to tell us that these different crosswalks are faded and they need to be repaired. We just knew that. I think it would give them um, a feeling that it's in the queue and going there. So those are my requests. And um, I just want to include the meeting by, um, you want to say something else? I want to add a shout out. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, C click fix works, and um, I don't know that everyone uses it as, as well or as effectively. I want to give a shout out to Rose Le Piccolo and, and, um, and to my son because my son approached me at, after picking up the O'Malley school. He wanted to tell me there's a sign that was ready to fall down, uh, like fire lane, don't park here. And I just decided so I would forget to do a C click fix. Literally 24 hours later, um, it's been repaired. My son feels like he's the mayor of Mailey School mm -hmm. recess or something. But um, I really give credit to Rose and the DW staff for playing together. So it works. It does That's work. Awesome. Oh, I've tried it and I, I don't think it works. So you can maybe walk me okay. through a short <laughs> I did it. Um, oh, I, I do want to just announce this one thing. So um, three years ago, before COVID, we had our first in many, 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 many years, a student government day. And um, I led the charge, student government day is in our charter and it's required, we're supposed to be doing it. And um, Council O'Hara gave me a friendly nudge um, a couple of weeks ago. And um, I'd like to just put that back on the docket. And the first thing that I would need to do is talk to the superintendent, see if there could be a commitment of a day, both at the high school and possibly O'Malley as well this year. And um, it wouldn't be till next year because it's going to be on the schedule. But what we did the last time around was really cool. And it was the beginning of a really good civic lesson for all the students at Gloucester High. Jane, I remember you, you escorted somebody for the day. And, and I had the privilege to, and I took them through City Hall, and, and they all came and spoke in our city council meeting, and it was really a cool day. So I'll pull out my material and start sharing it, but I hope that when we get to doing that, we get great representation from the council, but it does need to start with a commitment from the schools. So I will work through the mayor's office and Superintendent Lummis and to make that happen. It was the first and only day I've ever been mayor of the city as a student <laughs> mayor for a day. Just to following up on, on Councillor Wordley's shout out uh, to, to Rose. Yeah. Um, I, I think we all deserve our gratitude and thanks also to several other long-term city employees who are gonna be retiring, including Adrian Lennon, our conservation agent, and uh, Max Schenk, our director of public health. Absolutely. They're both men staff members so thank you counselor okay i think we've um, we're ready to adjourn is there a motion to adjourn Second. roll call vote council risotto yes council memard oh we're gonna party <laughs> yes council nolan yes council o'hara yes council o'neill yes council wordley yes council gilman yes yes is having good night everybody good night, good night. Thank you.